What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to episode number 586 of the Smart Guy Moment Smack Talk Podcast, Hot Tags of the Week. We're going to be breaking down what happened in the world of pro wrestling over the past few days we feel like talking about as far as rumors and gossip and news and TV talk and recaps and speculation on some current events going on in the next couple of days or so, and so on and so forth. I'm your host as always, Tony Mango. Joining me as always are Callum Wiggins. Hello there. And Robert E. Felice. Hey. And of course, we are going to be telling you what we think, but we want to know what you have to say. So drop your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure that you are sounding out whatever it is that you want to chat about. Either you are posting something on Facebook or the website, or you're tweeting something at us, or you are just leaving a comment on YouTube. If you are on YouTube, by the way, though, make sure you are subscribed and make sure you hit that little like button because that will help us out a long way. Also, click the share button if you want to pass this around to somebody who you think might be interested in checking out our podcast going forward in the future. And we will talk more about some other plug type stuff later on. We're going to kind of bounce between those today. But I want to start things off with one in particular to let everybody know that the Smart Madness tournament is currently going on now. The qualifying round is up on the website. You can find that on the sidebar on the right hand side of smartcomoma.com where you have the opportunity right now to vote on the final two of the entries for the bracket. Now we have a 32 uh, seed bracket going on right now. We already did the seeding for the bracket. We already settled all that stuff on a dark cast that happened a few, what, two weeks ago or so, somewhere around that, like that point. But we have two more spots available and we need to figure out what those are going to be. So there are about a dozen or so options for you to pick from, from the Andersons, the Bellas and the Kanye's to the steamboats and uh, the Watts family and uh, you know, Pillman involved in there too. So you have the option of voting on your three favorites. That way it's just, you know, a little bit easier for me to calculate the numbers for it. And the two that end up winning that will end up getting into the tournament and they'll be seated in those little spots that you can see on the bracket itself that just say TBD for right now. So one of them is going to go up against the Anawaii and one of them is going to go up against the Hearts. It's going to be really difficult for them, but hey, that's how seeding goes as far as tournaments are concerned. But go ahead and vote on that while you can. That is going to be up for the next few days. We will probably switch that on like maybe Thursday night or so, and I'll figure out the rest of the bracket. We'll have the tournament first round up for the hot tags next week. We'll come back to that when we do, but let's come back to the hot tags and then we'll uh, address some of the other things that are going on on the website right now. Let's talk about one of the perennial things that happens on the hot tags, trademarks (laughs) or slightly wrong trademarks. AEW has trademarked two different things. One of them is one of our, I guess, quote unquote, bigger stories for this week, which is the AEW all access reality show. We will talk more in depth about that. But first, just to get it out of the way, the trademark of AEW collision or as they trademarked Kalasan. I'm assuming that this is just a typo, but it is kind of strange that I haven't seen anything about them realizing the typo now and trying to file for a different one. No, they filed for a different one. Okay, I just hadn't seen that yet then, I guess. They, they, when they filed for all access, they filed for collision. <laughs> As they should, because <laughs> imagine that being the case where it's just like they settle on some new show or something and you end up getting that. Like, uh, if I'm like, ah, oh, you know, welcome to smart out moment or something. No indication of what ADW collision is yet, though, right? No, but it feels very much like an in ring based program who knows man maybe they're gonna merge dark and dark elevation and make it collision i still think it's a rename for forbidden door but that's just me it could be i mean that's another one of our topics that we're going to be talking about is the idea of a potential date for that but aw collision does sound to me more like it should be at least something in the ring and i don't think that it's going to be ring of honor associated because obviously that should be ring of honor collision or you know i mean they would have announced that probably with the other things but you get in the same kind of vibe callum you think AEW collision is just like another version of like an AEW dark or uh 
you think it's actually going to be like a full extra hour like rampage or what um i think it's going to be something something in ring but i couldn't even that it's it's too so generic a word in terms of fighting it's essentially AEW fight uh, that uh, it could literally be applied to anything. I don't think it's going to be like a new TV show or anything like that or a replacement for Dark or Dark Elevation. I certainly don't think it's going to replace the name Forbidden Door because I just think Forbidden Door is a... I mean, that's the that was the whole term associated with it and I think that they'll stick with that name going forward. But I could see it being some other kind of super show or something where like, oh, we're going to do... Two up, we've got another uh, links with another promotion that we're going to do a similar show to Forbidden Door. Or my hope, my hope is obviously just for my own biases that it's something to do with a UK show at some point, like a pay per view or whatever. Some other kind of like a I mean, I mean, I mean a- a- AW have a tendency to name uh, dynamite shows like these sort. Of That's things. true too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's Although a, they like, don't they don't trademark things by like, like Quake by the Lake, and I, they do so. typically t- refer to it as like AEW Dynamite Slam Dunk or AEW Dynamite Grand Slam, as opposed to just like Collision Grand Slam Dunk. <laughs> yeah, so it probably it probably would be a special show then, but they, they've already got. Um, I mean, if they, if it was going to be like a, a new pay per view, like AEW Collision, then uh, I mean, I could I could see it. I mean, six pay per views a year would probably be. A fair number. What's interesting is it's exactly the same, I think, description between all access and collision. The educational and entertainment services, namely a continuing program about wrestling accessible by radio, television, satellite, audio, video, and computer networks, entertainment services and the nature of live wrestling performances, entertainment services and the nature of production of wrestling programs and events. Entertainment services, namely an ongoing multimedia program featuring wrestling distributed via various platforms. I hate all that crap. Point being, ongoing series seems to be what it is. But that could mean ongoing series like Dynamite Rampage, or it could mean ongoing series like the All Access thing, or it could mean uh, ongoing series like every year they're going to do its pay-per-view. And I think if there's a chance it's a pay-per-view... What strikes me more is maybe it's not necessarily like a Forbidden Door rebranding. Maybe it's actually AEW versus Ring of Honor. And it could be like, all right, the two rosters are colliding. But it would be weird enough that they wouldn't call that, if they're going to go like AEW X New Japan Pro Wrestling Forbidden Door, that they wouldn't call it like AEW slash ROH collision. You know what I mean? Well, they didn't do that with Forbidden Door either. What do you mean? Because uh, Forbidden Door, the trademark is just AEW Forbidden Door. Oh, I guess they can't really necessarily do the New Japan part of it. So maybe they would. I mean, well, I mean, if it if the problem there would be that they don't have the access to trademark that because they don't own New Japan, he owns Ring of Honor, so I'm sure he could. But. That's the only thing that would strike me as far as like pay-per-view wise. So I I hope that they would never do this, but just thinking out loud, I did make a joke in another uh, work chat that I wonder if he's just going to say, fuck it. It's our Monday night show called collision and it's the, we're just going to fight them on Mondays. But then I also think they are going to be in LA for mania. Do they just run a special show where they're head to head with Mania, like the first Clash of Champions, call it Collision? And again, I'm just thinking out loud. I have zero idea. At this point, I'm surprised that they haven't announced anything for it because if the truth behind the AEW All Access thing was that they only filed the trademark two days before announcing it, which to me is baffling that they can have this kind of stuff in the works and then just be like oh we're just gonna wait to trademark it because what if something else happens what if you have an issue you know what i mean like i mean they probably know when they're going to file a certain trademark that they're not gonna run into any issue i'd imagine a lot of research is done beforehand yeah probably so but 
The AEW All Access show has been announced. It is going to be a reality show, and it is essentially at least giving me this vibe that they don't have roads to the top anymore. So they're like, well, let's do that, but without the roads <laughs> because we don't have them. <laughs> well, I hope they don't have the roads to the top. <laughs> yeah, because it's just like, okay, well, we, we were planning on doing that, and they're gone, so give us another show. And now... I, this really feels like it's kind of like, well, we were going to build that around Cody and Brandy. We need another couple. We've got Adam Cole and we've got Brett Baker. Let's just you've got Sammy, pivot. You've got Tay. They've already announced they're going to be on it. Eddie Kingston said he's going to be on it. I look at it like this. I will probably end up watching some of this. I'll check out at least the first being, episode and then I'll probably hate it and not watch anymore. <laughs> I don't see it being regular weekly viewing. Because I don't see them doing, like, remember TNA Reaction? Anybody? No. <laughs> Where it, it was, like, just a half an hour show of, yes, backstage stuff, but it was still in character. I don't see them doing that. So I will likely be tuning in for the people I care about, like the Adam Coles and the Bert Bakers, and then tuning out when it's about someone I'm not as much of a fan of. You don't uh, have any interest in checking out when they do like a deep dive on, I don't know, say like uh, Fuego. <laughs> uh, oh, well, you know, I'm such a big fan of Fuego. Yes. Just be like, okay, we got a, a season long arc about his broken foot or whatever injury he's got going on right now. It's a broken foot. I thought it was broken foot. Yeah. This is definitely high up on your DVR list, right, Callum? Well, if I had a DVR, then maybe. But uh, um, I think I, th- I think this could be an interesting concept to put uh, interesting concept to put out there. I don't think I don't necessarily think that it's just an absolute replacement for Roads to the Top. I think that there was always these rumblings about doing this kind of backstage style documentary, even when Roads was still with the company. So I think it's just, okay, we're just bringing that into fruition now and we've managed to secure another TV slot on uh, with, with uh, Warner Brothers Discovery. So I think that's the, to be honest, that's the most um, interesting aspect for it for me is that uh, that they are giving them this new TV show and this new like hour-long slot, which means that, yeah, things are going pretty well for them and they're probably going to mm-hmm. get a really big TV deal from them in the next year in order to keep them around. So it just shows that the relationship between them is good. And everyone that says like, Oh, the ratings are going down and that's, they must be in trouble now. It's like, yeah, that's total bullshit. They're clear. <laughs> there's clearly a strong relationship between AEW and Warner Brothers discovery. So, and then, but yeah, I, I think that this thing could be a good vehicle to get to know some of the people. I mean, like you guys say, people will come to see the guys like Adam Cole and see their stories and the draws, like, you know, if they do stuff with Kenny or the Bucks or stuff like that, that'll be the most interesting stuff. But I feel like it could also be a good vehicle to shine some light on people that don't get as much exposure on TV and help people see them in a completely different light. I mean, you joke about Fuego Del Sol, but say we do go on his story and his journey for recovery and how tough he's been finding it and how like he's been working hard to get back in the ring and try to build himself back up. That could be a nice, like underlying thing for a return to television with an underdog babyface story you never you never know with these reality shows i mean i w- i was never the biggest fan of like a total divas or total bellas or miss and miss and that, or, yeah yeah but you can't say that in certain aspects especially with total divas they didn't fuel stories on tv as well that they could just play off each other and they would play off of each other so i think if done correctly this could be a good vehicle to um present some people and build up their characters and their arcs and their yeah and or just build up their people's uh, knowledge of them so they can then be bigger stars on television on actual like dynamite or rampage see my issue with this is the same thing we've talked about when they announce the roads to the top show when they do any of these kind of things we've beat the drum a million times so i don't need to dive too deep into it but I've been burned too many times with these shows. Not a single one of them has actually been anything other than the same as what the other ones are. And they all follow that like Kardashian type standard reality show format. It's all 
scripted bullshit. It's all, let's try to put an emphasis on these relationships and the drama and you're arguing and, you know, let's take a, something that like really is not a big deal and let's manufacture to make it seem like it's so much bigger of a, an issue than it actually is, or let's just flat out make something up. And for me, I'm not in the slightest bit interested in those things. So I'll watch a show like this and almost guaranteed. I mean, I'm 99.99999% sure that this is going to how that be how it goes. I'll watch the first episode It'll have the same editing format, the same music choices, the same like talking head interstitials between different things. And about five minutes into it, I'm going to go, okay, this is exactly the same as some of the other ones. And then I just won't watch it anymore because it's, I mean, different strokes for different folks and everything, but that's never going to be something that I'm interested in, no matter who it's tracking because I just don't care about celebrity stuff like that. And I don't care about fake celebrity stuff even more so. But if they were to do like an AEW all access show behind the scenes, actual reality. Oh, I'd be so down for that. Cause I, I really think- liked the, uh, that era of um, being the elite when they were during the pandemic. And it was like, they're all just hanging out at Daly's place they're all doing stupid shit. Like just, okay, we're going to make up like a Gator golf thing that we're going to fight for the BTE championship. That stuff was fun when they started to get into like, and then now we're going to script a character for Nyla Rose to be doing something with Vicky and they're like nuns and stuff. I was like, this isn't funny. And then of course, when you get into like, I don't give a shit if like, jungle boy and Anna J are fighting backstage over their relationship. Who fucking cares? I, they, you know, doesn't matter to me. Well, would your wife care? No, honestly, I don't think so. She would never into total divas and all that. She loves those types of shows, but it needs to be like high level. <laughs> well, the way that she temp- typically describes it, it needs to be like top notch, absolute trash tv (laughs) like they need to be the biggest losers and they need to be absolute garbage human beings for her to be into that it's not just like like she does not watch like the kardashian things but she watches shows like 90 day fiance where it's just terrible people and like there's that you know you should be doing the crossover like that theoretically that should be the type of show that would be like well it's got the type of thing that she likes and it's got the wrestling like he likes don't we appeal to this market and then we would be exactly the opposite couple where we'd be like yeah neither of us are watching this and they'd go well goddamn you know what the hell <laughs> um i want to read a quote from a press release sent yesterday when dynamite cracked over a million views again it says aew has such an amazingly loyal dedicated fan base it brings in more than 4 million viewers to TBS every Wednesday night, said Jason Serlanis, the president of Turner Networks. Brandon Thurston followed that up, you know, trying to get more information on why they would say more than 4 million. And he says on Twitter, I'm told the measurement pertains to viewers who watched at least one minute of TBS on Wednesday from 7 to 12 a.m. each week on average, and a spokesperson for Warner Bros. Discovery said we attribute most of that success to AEW Dynamite. So yes, to Callum's point, they will be getting a massive TV deal and they're absolutely in great standing Mm -hmm. with their company. I mean, it goes to show enough that they're getting an extra show while Warner Bros. Discovery is cutting everything. Yeah, I mean, instead of this extra show, can we get uh, Batgirl? Nah, I'm, (laughs) I'm sure that that was terrible. But, you know, everybody, everybody keeps saying that that you know that that movie was like equal parts uh, a bad TV pilot, and then other people go, "It was amazing," and whatever. And uh, I mean, we yeah, could go. They're, they're in good standing. We could go down a deep dive on the idea of how it makes no sense to me that they are even trying to promote this Aquaman movie when, for all things considered, it seems like it's straight up terrible trash. But. 
Jason Momoa actually recently he said um, he has never had the pleasure of meeting Roman Reigns, but he gets the comparisons all the time, which is kind of funny. By the way, might as well use this uh, plug. Check out the Blueprint Project there over on Fanboys Anonymous. Check out what I would want to do when it comes to setting up a 100-story Batman project and all these other kind of things that goes along with the superhero genre. You can see it on your screen right now if you're on YouTube. Ninja Turtles, Star Wars, James Bond, Superman, Power Rangers, Thor, Spider-Man, X-Men. You name it, I've got some notes for it. Some of them way, way, way more detailed than you could possibly imagine where we start getting into the specifics of how many of the uh, one shot villains can I put in the story or what different variations of name aliases can I use for this people? And why would they call themselves this in this story? Or I just actually did a whole bunch of notes the other day about all the different things that they've said over the years have been Selena Kyle's parents. And I've settled on, well, I, I won't say. <laughs> so if you're interested in checking him. that out, what's that? Go support him. Go support you. Oh, yeah, definitely do. Definitely support the Blueprint Project there over on Fanboys Anonymous. Obviously, go to fanboysanonymous.com if you are interested in more stuff when it comes to movies and TV shows and comic books and video games and, and everything along those lines. Check out my thoughts on getting a new controller for being able to actually play the GoldenEye video game. And obviously check out a review to a kill for the James Bond series that we had done before plenty more content coming to you from fanboys anonymous. I want to do more and more and more and more for that. And of course, the more that you support fanboys, the more that you support smart cat moment in turn, because if one succeeds, the other one's going to succeed even more. So consider donating to the Patreon for that, subscribing to that YouTube channel, following on Facebook and Twitter and so on and so forth. Let's bounce back to some of these hot tags. Let's talk about, uh, well, you know, we're on the topic of this. Why not? So we were talking about AW Collision, possibly be in a pay-per-view name or something. And Rob, you mentioned the idea you think it might be a rebranding of Forbidden Door. The current, at least rumor, there's no confirmation about any of these quite yet, but it seems like this is what we're going to be getting. AEW Forbidden Door has been listed on Spectrum. I think it was Spectrum or Comcast. Yeah, it was Spectrum. It was Spectrum. As June 24th. So my first reaction, I went, oh, God damn, I got to cover a pay-per-view on my birthday. <laughs> and then I went, oh, wait, well, you know, not like I'm going to really bother to celebrate it all that much. Um, but Forbidden Door possibly coming on June 24th. And then on top of that, we've got more information. Again, no confirmation, 100%. But it seems that we are going to be getting, for the next WWE pay-per-views following WrestleMania backlash, which may or may not be called WrestleMania backlash. It seems more it like it might just like be backlash. It's just backlash. It's, it looks like it's just backlash, which would be better in my mind. Could be May 6th. And then May 27th, just a few weeks later, King and queen of the ring. And we had heard about this before. We talked about it already on probably even like two or three different episodes, of the hot tags, but the idea in mind being, WWE does not want to do the queen's crown. They want to make it king and queen of the ring and that they would do it around this time frame, which kind of makes a little bit of sense because this is around that time that they have been kind of tweaking over the past few years. And we got hell in a cell here before we got money in the bank here. They've put extreme rules somewhere around here. I think it was like 2020. They had extreme rules around this time. So clearly they're trying to figure out what the may thing is. And King and Queen of the Ring has been something that has been prior to SummerSlam before. Well, not Queen of the Ring, but King of the Ring used to lead into SummerSlam. And that kind of seems like it might be somewhat like that. I mean, this would lead into Money in the Bank more so. But hey, you know, potentially more confirmation on this. How do you guys feel about those three? Um, I, I think one of them will take place in Saudi and I'm Feeling more and more like guaranteed <laughs> King and Queen of the Ring. Uh, I don't like the idea that King and Queen of the Ring and Double or Nothing take place on the same weekend, but I'm sure it'll at least make for a fun filled weekend. And I, I love it. I look, this is, seems like three great shows. Backlash could be a lot of fun. I think on what we get at WrestleMania this year, uh, I'm all for King of the Ring. I'm all for Queen of the Ring. I'm all for it becoming a pay-per-view again. So 
this is a huge thumbs up for me all around. Um, I mean, it's hard to tell with Backlash because Backlash would just be a show. And a lot of that will just depend on what the fallout from WrestleMania is. So, um, so yeah, it's ha- it's happening. And I think we kind of all expected it to Backlash to be happening in one form or another. So, uh, I, so there's not really much excitement around that until we get close to the build and whether we're excited about it or not. Um, great that Forbidden Door will be coming back. So, yeah, very happy about that relationship continuing and seeing what they can do build from the first one uh king of queen of the ring i would I, w- I would be obviously disheartened as i always am if it does take place in saudi arabia but that's always that they're at least going to be doing two shows a year there so there's no point in getting too upset about it beyond what uh, how upset that you should be that they're still having a relationship with saudi arabia but in terms of the pay-per-view, I think that I'd only be super interested with it if they actually did not just the finals of the tournament there. I think you'd have to... like The, the thing that appealed to me about the old King of the Rings pay-per-views is that you essentially did the tournaments on that show. Mm-hmm. That's what made them just, special. If it's just the, yeah, so if it's just if it's just the final match and it's just like, oh, this is the final of the King of the Ring and the final of the, King, and the, final of the Queen of the Ring then it doesn't feel like it's a King and Queen of the Ring pay-per-view. It's just a pay-per-view where those two matches are taking place. Yeah. So I would hope that, I'd hope at the very least they would have both the semi-finals and the final for both of their things of the show. And that could take up, and that takes up like six matches of the card, and then you just throw in a few other extra matches, and you make sure the main event is one of those two matches. Downside to this, and I've said this before though, I don't think King of the Ring, especially if you throw Queen of the Ring in there, I don't think it works as a pay-per-view anymore. I think that it used to when you had a smaller roster. Because back in the day, I mean, you look at the way that they had like only really about 20 people. <laughs> if you then think about it on like the 93 roster. And really out of those 20 something people, not really many of them mattered too much. So you're able to have your six or seven main people on the card and build a pay-per-view around that. At this point, if you're going to have semi-final match, semi-final match, semi-final match, semi-final match, final, 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 you know, whatever it might be, you're really kind of limiting yourself to just a handful about a baker's dozen worth of people that can be on this show. And the likelihood that they're going to be building that around people that should be king and queen of the ring, the ones that actually could use it, probably really low. So do we want to see the queen of the ring be, okay, well, there's only four people that we can really put on this card. And since we need to get them on there, it's just Becky and Charlotte and uh, Bianca and Bosca or something. Or do we want to have more of like an actual tournament. And that's where I think that King of the Ring and now by proxy Queen of the Ring, I think it works better as like a week to week build. I actually don't like the idea of the King and Queen of the Ring pay-per-view anymore. I think that they'll probably air the semifinals and finals for each because that will about six matches on a card and you can have your weekly tv build in the process and it could get some new people on a card i'm all for that so i'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt right now and then see what the follow-through is on this tournament and then maybe by SummerSlam, i'll feel more comfortable about saying yay or nay to this as a concept I also think that there is a chance that because they're putting these two reviews right next to each other, they might be splitting the difference. It could be like, well, you're going to get your universal title match at Backlash. You're going to get your, uh, you know, the SmackDown Women's Championship match, the Raw Women's Championship match. Like you're going to get those matches at Backlash. And then King and Queen of the Ring is going to be the undercard people. That sounds worse than it should be, but you know what I mean? Like, that's where you would see somebody like a 
Mustafa Ali wrestling. But he's not going to get a spot like that on when you try to get a regular pay-per-view as much. Maybe that's their game plan. That way they can build two pay-per-views at the same time. And then it's just, all right, we do backlash at the beginning of the month. At the end of the month, this is this one. And then we're setting up. Uh, what's the pay-per-view that comes immediately after that? That would be that would be Money in the Bank, I think, right? Yeah, so well, even that, a month after. Even that, though, it is a little bit wonky, I think, to to set up like a tournament and then go into like a Money in the Bank. But <laughs> maybe they have a game plan. I don't know. At this point, I, I'm i not. Again, you have a month between the tournament and the Money in the Bank. but Yeah, but we also have about six weeks to set up uh, some of the stuff for WrestleMania. And I'm not <laughs> feeling super strong on some of those things. So uh, it makes every card feel special. And I mean, AEW has a different build, but AEW does this shit all the time where they're just like, and we're out of fighter fast and in the fight for the fallen. And, you know, and here's the Owen Hart, which will lead you to double or nothing. Which So if you do it right and spotlight the right people, I, I have faith. Foolishly so. But I have faith. <laughs> yeah, currently not in the super duper. I have faith in in either company right now. Not that this is the worst we've ever had, but I gotta say, man, this week uh, took a hit for WrestleMania for me <laughs> on uh, that end. So maybe they don't know exactly what they're doing. Uh, but we'll pay more attention to that as time goes on, and of course, when we start factoring in plans for what we do on this podcast going forward, you know, we've got the ideas that we have for like these different blank weeks and all, maybe we get something related to King of the ring and queen of the ring. And maybe we do something based off of that. Maybe we, uh, dive deeper into some of that, that we've done in the past with, um, with backlash or something. Stay tuned. We'll let you know when we know, but forbidden door, and all those, when they get confirmed, they will be up on the website with confirmations and stuff. Obviously, check out the pay-per-view schedules to get the most up-to-date stuff. And also, when you're checking out the website, just to, a little bit of a reminder for anybody who is not aware and hasn't already done it, join our Road to WrestleMania contest, where we've got three Dusty Roads Funko Pops that we are giving out as sponsored by Fun.com. And there are multiple different ways that you can enter the contest, multiple different ways for you to win the contest by proxy, because you can follow our Facebook and Twitter accounts. You can post a retweet of different things. You can actually even get some points when it comes to picking up some merchandise. You know, if you want to buy a t-shirt or something, you get a lot of entries for that. If you are on our Patreon scales, then we've got those for those different tiers. So if you want a Dusty Rhodes Funko Pop, then enter the contest and maybe you'll win. Who knows? Come back to another hot tag. Let's talk about Lindsay Dorado. Not something that I was expecting to talk about this week, but he has said that this is going to be the last year he's going to wear a mask. And he put out a picture where he's got the mask off, but you can't really see his face and all that. He had said that he's been wrestling under the mask for a while and he doesn't feel like that's him anymore. And he wants to just like be more of himself and, yeah, I mean, obviously we're not following Lindsay's career as much as when he was in WWE, but I'm curious what the trigger was for this and what he's going to do going forward. Like, is he still going to be Lindsay Dorado or is he going to be just like his regular name or why he decided to unmask like this? And he's already even said, like, am I going to lose it? Am I going to just give it up? What are you guys thinking about this? It's cool. I mean, he's, one of the few people who's doing his own thing. He's in MLW. He's doing the Indies. If he's having fun in his wrestling career and feels like this can take him to the next level, I'm all for it. Uh, what do I think about this? Nothing, because I haven't thought about Lindsay Dorado until since about two years before he got released. <laughs> Would that would that change if you if I told you he was doing good lucha things? Uh, it hasn't helped me with Kalisto. Well, <laughs> so I don't even know where he is right now. So like, 
on, on, you know, honestly, if you told like you could have told me he retired, you could tell me that he's like he's wrestling for like like ten different promotions at the same time. If he's the world champion in AAA or whatever, I'd have no no clue what was going on with Lindsay. I mean, fair enough. Same kind of deal. I haven't been tracking his career either. But when I saw this story, I thought it was pretty interesting because it's pretty rare when somebody decides that they don't want to be a luchador anymore like that. And I wonder what uh, had triggered that. I wonder if that's going to be like. He's got a new character in mind, or I don't know, but I'm going to be paying more Probably attention a thing to it. That where he feels he can just express more of himself rather than play this character. I feel like he'll keep the name just because the branding is easier. You own all of it and all that. But I can understand saying I'm going to take the next step in my career. It could be also that he's just like, you know, I've been doing the masked thing and now it's more of an albatross. Maybe so. I don't know. Take a pick. Do we go with the 2K23 roster ratings or do we go with the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards? What do you guys want to do um, first? Let's go the Observer. I haven't heard these, so I'm a little more interested. So... 2022 Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards. Obviously, we already did our Smart Cow Moment End of the Year Awards. We did them over two months ago. And I think that they are, you know, obviously different categories and uh, different voting process and everything. That is what our personal picks are. It's not something that's based off of people voting in and doing that. So different animal entirely. But for anybody who is interested in the WON side of things... Here are some of our uh, winners for this year, which is very, very heavily into the AEW side of things. Like, there's no comparison. Almost nothing was WWE related on this. The best booker and the promoter of the year both went to Tony Khan. I don't think okay. Ariel Hawani likes that all that much. <laughs> I, I think, I think, I think that's fair for both of them. <laughs> Is that just that? But that's my perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I both sides of AEW and WWE have been. I think we've said it before. I mean, a lot of the stuff we've already said before. I think that AEW had a really, really rough year, and I think that WWE had a rough year. And I actually kind of feel like AEW didn't do. They didn't have a lot of things that happened in that year that they should have done, and they had less going on in some ways than WWE. So I kind of, I don't think either of them were really great, <laughs> but yeah. You know. I mean, it's not the problem with the booker promoter categories. It's not a very wide category, right? You've got who does WWE, who does new Japan. I mean, if you were really like, Oh, wow. Court Bauer really killed it in MLW, but you know, I can see how Tony Khan got the award. Mm -hmm. Best gimmick went to Sami Zayn. We've all sung his praises. Yeah, I think so. we all echoed that during our own award show. Not a little surprised. Worst gimmick went to Maximum Male Models, and I'm like, you know, I've seen a lot worse than Maximum Male Models. I've seen worse, <laughs> and they they made me laugh. Uh, I, scripts, I think, fuck I think scripts. it's just the overall. I think the overall thing with Maximum Male Models is because they just they haven't done anything at all. Like it's 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 a complete waste of time. At least um, scripts. Like him or loathe him has actually won matches. Maximum Male Model actually just are a nothing entity in WWE. But realistically, it should go to even Bray Wyatt or Uncle Howdy. They should be the worst. Mm -hmm. I was going to say Uncle Howdy, actually. Howdy was second in the list. Well, also but keep in mind for when it comes to these kind of awards, and this is something that nobody ever seems to spe uh, like spell out, except for me. I'm the only type of person that bothers to do this type of shit. There is an extreme heavy bias on Raw, SmackDown, and Dynamite. People just don't watch NXT as much. So they don't see as bad as Scripps is. And they don't see on like somebody testing out a character on AEW Dark. There's just not as many people that are voting for that because they're all watching like well i watch monday night raw and i don't watch nxt so the worst thing of the year is this thing that's on raw or smackdown and i've seen it I mean, you know across the board whether it comes to like the the votes that we do on smart count moment or when it comes to 
if you look at somebody's lists on different other things, like some message boards and Reddit posts and all, to even just like conversations with casual fans, like, you know, friends of mine, if I'm like, you know, ah, this person's the worst person on the roster, and then they debate back and forth, nobody ever mentions things from like NXT. Nobody mentions anything. Nobody would ever be like, back when it was on the air, oh man, the worst in-ring performer in the women's division is uh yeah name somebody from nxt uk because they don't watch it so in their mind like oh the worst would be tamina you know what i mean so as bad as maximal male models is it gets boosted for these votes because people aren't watching the other shows to go woof that nxt guy popped up and he did jack shit like i don't know i'm going to specifically mention this but like you could be like, oh, who's got the worst momentum of the year? Draco Anthony. And nine out of ten people will be like, who the fuck are you talking about? I mean, you know? I have no idea who you're talking about. Who's Draco Anthony? <laughs> he, uh, I don't even, it was the very beginning of the year or if it was tail end of 2021 or something. He had popped up. He had like three See, matches. That, he that, lost that, it all. Vignettes, like, I'm going to be a thing. Mm-hmm. And, and then, then it? Oh, yeah, 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 he okay. lost a couple matches and then. Uh, Joe Gacy was like, how about you join me? And he was like, I'll think about it. And then they fired him. Oh, and then they fired him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I remember yeah. that guy. Now. So it's like somebody like that, I would be the type of person that would do this deep dive and be like, yeah, you know, that guy's like one of the, the worst bookings of the entire year. And the majority of people voting on these lists are going to be like, I've never seen him. So to me, the worst is this episode of Monday Night Raw. Or so, you know what I mean? So well, there is worse than Maximal Male Bottles. But how many people are watching scripts? So that's something. Um, he still loses because he was Reggie and Reggie didn't have a great year either. Yeah. <laughs> Worst TV show went to Raw. As they should. NXT, though. Like, I, but again, NXT you know. Yeah. NXT, NXT was second. Okay. Like, those, those, two, those two were miles ahead of anybody else. It's the worst shows of the year. Fair enough, then. And there is that weighted thing too. Raw has three hours. Raw has three hours. And that's three hours it's so been. much easier to make that just feel like a slog. And it's also like, well, you know, I mean, it's it's Monday Night Raw. It's the institution. It should be the best. So when it disappoints, it disappoints harder. If I watch like this episode of AEW this week, for instance, I barely paid any attention to it. I had it on the entire time. It just wasn't capturing my attention. But since it's AEW and it's two hours, it doesn't sting as much as when it's like, oh, you know, I sit down for Monday Night Raw and it should be top of the line and then screw you. It ended up being the worst and stuff. So, yeah, that that hurts people more. Same was, you know, worst promotion of the year goes to WWE. Then again, that's also because WWE had some really bad stuff this year, too. So. Although the NWA pulled it really close this time. Yeah. Like, look, I got to tell you, as a guy who watches all wrestling, NWA is worse. It's the NWA. It's the NWA. And nobody wants to like the NWA more than me. It's Billy Corgan and it's the National Wrestling Alliance. I want to like this thing. It's so bad. Like, you're showing a bias and you're showing that you don't watch enough if you are putting WWE over the NWA. I can name several things WWE this, did this year that I enjoyed. I can't do that for the National Wrestling Alliance. I think I had watched the first three episodes of power and I was like, well, you know, this isn't really doing it for me, but at least then it seemed like they had something to them. And really over this past year, it seems like NWA is just kind of fallen apart. Like crazily like over the past year, like two, two, like two, three years or so ever since, probably since the first like year of power, it's been that pandemic like, hit. They, they were cool yeah, for about yeah, a second. Yeah, that hit, pandemic, yeah, pandemic hit. hit and then it went off a cliff and they've come back worse than ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The worst feud of the year went to Miz and Dexter Loomis. Mm. Again, Again that, that's, that's one of those things that argue. like, like it, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can see why, but then I also go, you missed out on some really bad feuds in NXT, you know? No, no, this no, Miz and Dexter Lewis was way worse than anything in NXT this year in terms of feud. Yeah. Well, Pat McAfee and Vince McMahon got the worst match of the year. So, yeah. I mean, I would personally go with uh, Ric Flair's 
that last match. <laughs> Since that's an yeah. option that they can pick, they really should have because that was a it came second. travesty. Yeah, that one came second. The Pat McAfee and Vince McMahon thing, like it was that it's it, look, it's it not good. Novelty. Yeah, that it's a match. it's not by all. If you're judging based off of like, well, you know, you're going to compare that to like Okada versus somebody. Yeah, you know, Pat McAfee versus Vince McMahon's not some five star match, but they had fun with it. Whereas the Flair one, it just sucked all across the board. It was no. nerve wracking. It wasn't interesting in the ring. He did a terrible job. It, it it just sucks in every possible conceivable way. Pat McAfee versus Vince Man is one of the worst matches of all time. It is. It's like, just take out the mindset that Vincent Man is Vincent Man and Pat McAfee is Pat McAfee. The fact that he'd already wrestled and beaten the guy who you actually try to push on the roster and then putting a 70 odd year old man out there that just can't do anything and the finish is kicking a football at his legs or something <laughs> and hoping for the best. Yet yeah. But then by, to- by proxy, take out the fact, if you say take out Vince McMahon's Vince McMahon and Pat McAfee's Pat McAfee, if you take out Ric Flair's Ric Flair and you just yeah, watch yeah. that match, it's horrendous, you know? Well, no, because at some point you see Andrade versus either Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal and it's fine. It's only the bits with Ric Flair. that are terrible in that match. I think so, they- I look at it I, as like, well, we got the Stone Cold thing. That's more entertaining than Ric Flair afterward being like, I don't know where I am, but that wasn't the match. Uh, no, but still, I like I that goes in with it, you know. No, it doesn't. It's not the match. So you don't ever look at anything happening after a match as being a contributing factor to your not positives or negatives. Of, not if I'm voting for match of the year. No, I, I that's, that's the match of the year. So I think that that's spell to spell. That's a, a a level of um, restraint that you have that most people don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, just like because I can judge based on let's take Royal Rumble this year. The angle after the main event is like it's a five star angle that followed a two or three star match. Callum is correct. No, I mean yeah, like literally yeah. But I mean most people don't look at it that way because look at uh, something like the um the rise of stone cold steve austin like people talk about king of the ring being one of the best pay-per-views of all time and they're like yeah because he caught that promo that's how they people look at it correct yeah. they would they would be can, yeah also can i ask a question just for rob rob have you ever heard anyone say that Royal, uh, the king of the ring 96 is one of the greatest pay-per-views of all time i haven't but i'd like you to point them out <laughs> to me because i'll tell them they're wrong i mean yeah. I, I love the new generation era but they're wrong because that that show sucks What are the other matches that uh, did they have information on? Like oh, uh, number three, oh, yeah, so number got, four, I've, number uh, one. Yeah, yeah. So I've got all the um, I have the awards up because I've got the newsletter up. So, uh, so obviously, Pat McAfee was number one worst match of the year, and then it was the uh, Ric Flair's last match. After that was Shotzi and uh, Ronda Rousey at Survivor Series. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. The Men's Royal Rumble. Yeah. Uh, Matt Cardona versus Trevor Murdoch versus Tyrus, which is the match that Tyrus wins the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. And a lot of those Euro things, Star. too. Like, I'm sure, because I don't watch any of it, I'm sure that there's, like, some just oh, yeah, bottom-of-the-barrel like, shit in NWA and bottom-of-the-barrel shit in the dark, and, you know. Yeah, but it, I think that, obviously, these ones have more high profile, so you're going to... You're going to get more votes for it. They're the same yeah. as what we talked about the other part, yeah. The final two ones, well, this one's controversial because I, I definitely don't agree with this one, but I know it would anger a certain type of wrestling fan. But the sixth one was Sami Zayn versus Johnny Knoxville from WrestleMania. Oh, you're just you're dead fucking wrong. You're dead wrong. It's, it, was, it was only 17 people that voted for it. You, like it gets a big drop off at this point, but uh, but yeah, that's that's a great match. So people that voted for it are just like, oh, I don't like this comedy shit, but it's it was a great mm-hmm. match. It's, it's like if you can admit that you know the Vince thing was. Bad. I think the Knoxville thing was good in all the ways that the Vince yeah. thing was bad. Yeah. And then the final match they had listed as a worst match of the year is the uh, casino uh, ladder match, which MJF won when he came back as, and it just got taken out by the firm. I, I can see why that would upset. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a bad one. And that's the type of thing that, like, leading up to the very end of that is perfectly fine. It's not anything special. It's not anything horrible. But everybody just got annoyed about the end of it. So then they were like, well, oh, the whole thing... Yeah, you know, it doesn't matter now. The whole thing sucks. Yeah, 
I mean, it's a I shame that like that, that people aren't voting more for like that Indy Hartwell versus Lash Legend match that we were talking about. Oh yeah, but yeah, I think again, it's. I mean, all of these ones are pay per view matches, so I guess it leans yeah. more heavily towards that because they're the ones you actually you know quote unquote pay for. And those are the ones no, you remember more, and, and you yeah, know. NXT sucks. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah. let's back to the uh, end of the year awards. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. we, we talked about that quite a bit. Some of the other ones that we got going on here, though, we got best major wrestling show for Ben Door. Uh, I I would co-sign that one. Yeah, we talked about how yeah. there were a lot a lot of good things on that card. Worst one was Royal Rumble. Kind of a flat thing in some ways, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as, no. as, I mean again, you got let's say the ones that got here got Elimination Chamber after that as well. So basically, the start it was a bad start of the year for WWE. Based yeah, off, it on these wasn't ones. good. You have a GCW The World, which also uh, took place early in the year. That was at the Hammerstein. Yeah, that yeah. wasn't great. Yeah. Uh, Rick Flair's last match, of course. Yeah, yeah, that really uh, should be up on that. There. That NWA hard times free, yeah. Uh, which should again the match that where, where Tyrus won, and then it's just a load of WWE. Well, it's it's uh, Crown Jewel, WrestleMania Night Two, uh, Halloween Havoc, NXT Halloween Havoc. Interesting in the year. Um, and then you have All Out, and then Extreme Rules. All right, look, All Out was a fucking great show. I don't care. Yeah, I know. It's all, it was, yeah, that that's one of the ones where people, you are right, Tony. There, people are just saying like, yeah, because of all the backstage stuff that happened after the show, it's a bad. It was a bad mm-hmm. show. That was a great show. Like, I, I'll say it's, it's like it's one of AEW's overall probably weaker pay per views, but it's definitely not like one of the worst shows of the year. I don't think. But that's where, like, you know, again, we can repeat it over and over. Like, you know, Royal Rumble gets voted the worst. I'm sure if I watched some of those GCW shows, they were fucking garbage, you know, <laughs> but nobody, yeah. nobody watches them. So mm-hmm. less people are going to vote for him. If you sat down, everybody voting and you forced them to watch all of the shows, then they would have a different story. Yeah. Best wrestling yeah. maneuver went to Will Ospreay's hidden blade, which that's an insane. example of somebody standing out more outside of the AEW and uh, WWE side of things. That made fucking rules. Hidden block. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, that, 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 I, I can see what they're doing. I mean, uh, Will Ospreay is very much beloved by the um, Observer audience. It's just a cool move. Like, it, it's a great move. I like this one. Most disgusting promotional tactic. Vince McMahon coming out on television for a crowd mm-hmm. pop after the allegations. Hard to uh, argue yeah. against that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he went in there to try and uh, pop a right in. All the way around, yep. I I also say that uh, Ric Flair's last match is on the list for this as well. I would, it's so close. If Vince McMahon didn't do that, I think it has to be Ric Flair's last match, but Vince does go right on TV just to say, and now, and then look at Here's John Cena. (laughs) That's his last thing on TV. Probably, I would honestly say probably ever. I still think we'll we're going to see him again. Yeah, yeah, we'll see, yeah, we'll see I don't, I don't, at this point, I don't rule anything out. No. Um, let's see. Uh, a little bit of a lightning round when it comes to some of these things. Worst television announcer, Corey Graves. Oh, I don't think that that's necessarily right. I would certainly um, agree with it. Callum, you over that one? <laughs> <laughs> either, either him or uh, well, Booker was second. That one again Booker makes me laugh. Listen to the people like the Jim Ross, was third. Jim Ross was third, though, and it was close between those. Those three stood out above everybody else, like miles ahead of everyone else in the boat. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've said right. plenty of times by now, JR is just not the JR of old. But again, listen to more of like a pseudo shot type, and Tommy Court Graves isn't a little bit better than that. Kevin Kelly got best television announcer. I'm surprised about that. Yeah, Marty did. No, he did. I'm not surprised. Like, he's one of the best he he there, there ever was. And he's a straight up announcer. Yeah, was, I guess people are still not quite willing to praise Michael Cole. <laughs> uh, Michael Cole was on this. He he finished eighth place. Eighth? That That's ridiculous. Yeah. What were the other? So it's Excal- between uh, it's Caliber second. That I can yeah, understand. Yeah, uh, Ian Rock- Riccoboni third. Yeah. I'm not a fan of Riccoboni style. Uh, in the minority, uh, Taz. Fourth. <laughs> Taz is fun though. <laughs> uh, pa- Pat McAfee, fifth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd, put, I'd put Cole above McAfee. Uh, Chris Charlton, sixth. Who's that? Okay. Uh, New Japan, uh, color uh, Yeah, I don't know. Man. He's very knowledgeable. 
yeah, he's yeah he has a lot of information and he can speak Japanese as well, which is very helpful. Is and uh, Tony Chavani seventh. Chavani's great. And then and then Michael Cole. Hmm. I yeah. thought that checks out. They would be the people I put in. I just rearranged it a little bit. Probably put Cole a little closer to the top. I'd definitely not put McAfee too high up there. Best non wrestler went to Paul Heyman. Yes. William Regal, very uh, the closest compared to him. Rookie of the year went to Braun Breaker. Who's number two on that one? Hook is number two. And then three is Logan Paul. Hmm. Braun Breaker had a great year. They don't like him anymore. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, it's a little weird that that's the story. Well, haven't you heard that like story that's come out that from the uh, actually from the Wrestling Observer saying that uh, that they essentially are now putting plants in the audience that are booing Bron Breaker. It's a little weird, right? What I think that I think they're telling this. St- I think uh, this is again. It's it was speculation by um, Alvarez. Be after the point after the reporting of it. I think the reporting of it is supposedly accurate, but. Um, his speculation is that they're going to try and test Bron Breaker out as a heel in NXT before they decide to bring him up to the main roster, and then they'll decide whether he goes baby face or heel. Hmm. Just let the guy be Goldberg. Like the guy, fucking, he's a big guy who does big explosive moves. What are you missing here? Like, well, I think I, th- I think the fact that he is so green and still fresh, like he obviously he's got a lot of talent to him, but I think they, I think it. It's not the the worst idea in the world to test him out as see how he works the heel because he yeah. hasn't ever experienced that style of wrestling before. Or he's he's not practiced in that style of wrestling. It's very different than working as a babyface. He needs like this is what I would do with him. Like you get a veteran in there, a Brock or a Randy, and you just mess him up, like bloody him up, and let him explode in the comeback. And I think people would be absolutely behind Braun Breaker. Just call him Rex oh, Steiner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've gotten yeah, used to yeah, the first of all, call him Rex Steiner. But, but I also think that it would be a good opportunity to do a double turn between him and Carmelo. Mm-hmm. I can see that. I don't know, Because Carmelo's getting over, like, big. He's over big with the crowd. And he seems to be, again, from what I watch of NXT, he seems to be now taking on more of just, like, I'll take on all comers type attitude. Yeah, he's, like I said, if anyone's going to... Pick up the ball where the Adam Cole era dropped it. He has the chance. Uh, what other categories we got going on here? Um, best flying wrestler. I still don't know how to pronounce his name. El Vikingo. Del, the Ving, Del Ve- Vikingo, yeah. Um, closely followed by Ray Phoenix. They were both out, out to both the two outstanding ones. Like miles ahead of anyone else. Yeah. You can't go wrong with either pick. Still haven't seen a single match of his, so I can't say yay or nay. But at least when it comes to most overrated Ronda Rousey, I could say yay on that one. <laughs> yeah. So it was Ronda Rousey, closely followed by Tyrus. And then it's Roman Reigns and CM Punk, which are both wrong. But some people just get butt hurt by those two. I honestly, I don't know if Tyrus is overrated. I think he's perfectly rated just fine. I think. Well, he's world. I guess he's world champion. I guess they're going by the perspective he's overrated by the people that hire him. Yeah. And uh, the CM Punk thing is full of shit. You're full of shit. CM Punk was fun to watch. Leave it alone. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think that he didn't bring as much to the table as what they touted him to do, but he wouldn't have been my vote. I mean. Obviously, go back to the AW awards and the WWE awards. You'll see our most overrated when it comes to that. Most underrated, uh, they voted on Kanosuke Takeshita. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chad Gable coming up second there. That's cool. Yeah. Takeshita's great. Gable's great. I will never not feel for him when I went through that interview where he tells the new Salcedo, yeah, ever since Triple H took over, I feel useful. So, you know, you just. Mm-hmm. You feel for the guy. The Brian Danielson award went to Brian Danielson. <laughs> yeah, the Brian Danielson award for best technical wrestler. <laughs> yeah. Came so, back. That's pretty <laughs> funny. Yeah. Again, it's one of those ones where it's like it was him and then it was Zack Sam Jr. and then everyone else. <laughs> and Moxley gets the best brawler. That makes sense. Yeah, in a landslide. Most charismatic goes to MJF. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Sammy Zayn second in that one. 
Most approved goes to the acclaimed. Makes sense. Yep. Yep. Followed by uh, Mina Shirakawa from uh, Stardom. No idea who it is, so <laughs> I'll just say maybe thumbs up on that. Feud of the year went to the Briscoes against FTR. Yep. In ring, that's yeah, definitely deserving. The two, uh, yeah, the uh, two uh, landslide ones here for FTR um, and the Briscoes, and then behind them was CM Punk versus MJF. Yep, and it was a correct. big, there was a big fall down to third place for Cody Rhodes versus Seth Rollins. Best box office draw went to Roman Reigns. Makes sense. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. Roman Reigns. Yeah, there are three three people for pro wrestling rank, ranked here: it's Roman Reigns, John Cena, and then CM Punk. Hmm. Uh, let's see this block. This block's got the Hodge Award for non heavyweight MVP, Leo Delvey Kingo. Yep, Again. followed by Darby, Darby Allen and El Desper- Desperado. He also wins Mexico's MVP. Mm-hmm. So a lot of that, you know, hey, if you're voting for that guy for the one thing, you probably for the other ones, it makes sense. Will Ospreay got the European MVP. Makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but and yeah, in a total landslide, he got seven. He got nearly 800 votes. The second place guy got 95. Mm. So. Oh, and it makes sense, of course, Okada's got it, the Japanese MVP champion and everything. Um. Siri has women's wrestling MVP. Who's Siri? Uh, she was uh, the stardom world champion for the majority of the year, and she is an exceptional talent in the ring. Hmm. I don't um, think I've ever seen her. No, you don't watch stardom, so it's not surprising. No, but I, mean, I don't even think that I've seen like a clip of her or anything. Like She doesn't look familiar. I think this is the year where I'm going to really try to get actually got- to Joshi. I actually got my start. I got a start on a subscription, and I've been just meaning to find some time to just binge a lot of it. Nice. Um, they're on, they're so, on Wrestle Universe, right? I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I just went straight to Stardom and got a script, subscription from them instead. Okay. So, but um, second was Bianca Belair. Uh, third yeah, was, makes sense. And, and third was Jamie Hayter. I'd put Becky over Jamie, but I get it. Becky was sixth. She was gone for most of it. Yeah. yeah, she was what? she was she was out for a little while. I, I, I'd say Becky was one of the MVPs of the year as well, but like, I don't think place I can I can understand that. The uh, best weekly TV show was Dynamite. The mm-hmm. yeah. promotion of the year AEW. As I said, a lot of these skewing more towards the AEW and New Japan kind of side of things. Tag team of the year went to FTR. Hey, if you go through different promotions and you win all those titles. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I I would have so, gone with the USO still, but so they got yeah. FTL got three times the number of votes in second place, which was the Briscoes. The third uh, place was Usos. Young Bucks. Okay. Mm, wow. And then fourth, and then fourth was the USOs. Makes sense. And and then the acclaimed fifth, and they were kind of like the five standout ones. The match of the year went to Okada Osprey. This one's quite funny actually because it's um. So Okada, it's it's the Okada Osprey match um, finals of the G1, which is uh, again an excellent match between those two. Then it's followed by FTR versus Briscoe's dog collar match, mm-hmm. which was very which cut it very very close. Then it's Okada versus Will Osprey from Wrestle Kingdom, mm-hmm. and then it's FTR versus Briscoe's in their first match. So what so you're saying so, is. <laughs> So it's when only two Osprey, Okada Osprey, then FTR Briscoe's, then Okada Osprey, then FTR Briscoe's as the there's, four best matches of the year. There's only two matches you need to see. Yeah. And then uh, the, the, ne- the fifth place, um, the first WWE match, and it was uh, Gunter versus Sheamus from Clash of the correct. Castle. And then, of course, just to round it out, Osprey got most outstanding wrestler, and Moxley got wrestler of the year. I think if you're yes. an AEW feud. Voting group? Yeah, Moxley should get rest of the year. I'm pretty yeah, sure that he got Mo- most of our votes when it came to like MVP of AEW at, at the end of our yeah. year. So Yeah, so just uh, just round it off then top ten for wrestler of the year was uh, Moxley, obviously winning, uh, Roman Reigns second place. Uh, then Will Ospreay, Kazuchika Okada, Siori, Chris Jericho, MJF, CM Punk, uh Julia. And then Brian Danielson. No idea who Julia is either. Also, uh, she's, yeah, she's Stardom as well. It was actually that those two were the MVPs of Stardom this year, mm. so I understand why they're both on there. 
So again, obviously, if you want to know more of what our personal opinions were, go back and check out our end of the year awards for AEW and WWE. Those smarkies are two months old, but those opinions still hold pretty much. Let's talk about the 2K23 roster ratings. And we're not going to, you know, sit here and go like uh, Asuka's an 89 and Bailey is a 91 and Butch is an 81. And we're not going to repeat all that kind of stuff. You guys can find it all online. But generally speaking, the idea being in mind, if you look at the ratings between different people, at the very, very top of the list, you've got like Becky Lynch as a 96, The Rock as a 96, etc. You know, you can... uh go through and kind of debate between different people and all. Is there anything that stands out to you that you think somebody should be higher or lower than where they were, especially in comparison to somebody else? Like, are you like, ah, you know, it doesn't make any sense that Jey Uso is a 90, but AJ Styles is an 89 or why is Tyler Breeze a 77 and uh, Dominic Mysterio is a 78 or what I found funny. Why is Elias a 78? But they have uh, Ezekiel, I think, at another number <laughs> that they separated the two. Ezekiel, yeah, Ezekiel, Ezekiel's 83. So, yeah, Ezekiel's 83 and Elias is 78. So it's kind of funny that it's the same exact guy, but it's two different numbers. Any stand out uh, to you guys? I mean, I mean, there's a few ones which I probably wouldn't agree with, but at the end of the day, it's like much of a much. It's like I'm not going to get too upset over some yeah. uh, video game ratings. But things like Angelo, An- Angelo Dawkins at 80 seems a bit low, a bit unfair. Um, the, the fact that uh, Com- and, I know Carmella, we could talk about her and her response to it, but Carmella, got, uh, Carmella has a 79 when you consider that uh, Gigi Dolan has 81 and JC James has 80. Seems a bit odd that she's lower than both of those. Does it? Um, she's not uh, much lower I mean, than them, and they are presented more as the stars of their brand. I would say that it would be a bit odd that Kamala has got as many shots at the uh, the women's championship as she has throughout her career. If she's worse than those two, but you know, much for much this. Like Rick Boogs with seventy five. I guess it's understandable. He's one of the lowest ones on there. Same with Shotzi on 75. Our truth at 72. Yeah, why is he so low? He's up, um, man. He's he's what's up? Yeah. What are we doing here? I think I think oh, all right, fundamentally, if like JC Jane and Gigi Dolan are 80 and 81, the Neo Sky needs to be more than 82. I agree with that statement. Yeah, Sky's worst worst rate than Ezekiel. Yeah, it's a little guy's weird. worse rated than uh, Liv Morgan, apparently. That's not right. Mm. I would say, uh, like, you know, you're splitting hairs when it comes to Zelina Vega at 74 and Shotzi at 75, but they, neither of them yeah. accomplished anything, so they pretty much should be kind of the same. It is kind of interesting that they the have, like, the Miz is 85, and then they have Miz 2011 at 90, and it's like, that's got to feel weird, you know? <laughs> Well, Obviously, he's that's he's around the time he's, he's champion. Off, yeah. It's, yeah, he's champion at the time, so it's you know, but it's it is weird to be like, hey, remember, twelve years ago you were a ninety, and now you're an eighty five, kind of. It just I don't know. Sammy Zayn at eighty four seems a bit low now. Yeah, obviously yeah, but, they've they programmed some of this stuff ahead of time, but it is it, you know they can make changes. We saw that one of the things that changed is Gunther. He was an eighty eight. <laughs> And they decided to change him to an 89. Yep. <laughs> for <laughs> reasons that I won't say the on the uh, the algorithm for YouTube, <laughs> at least. <laughs> I mean, I mean, again, this one was done probably way before what how the bookings actually ended up being, but like carrying cross IE6. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, right? Not, not, not nowadays, no. I don't know why there's also such a big uh, gap between Katana Chance and Caden Carter. Considering the fact they're both at pretty much equal skill level, like Katana's mm-hmm. at seventy nine and Caden's at seventy six. Yeah, but she did that Royal Rumble thing, you see. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's basically it, right? Yeah. And for anybody wondering, the absolute highest of them all is Roman Reigns. He is a ninety nine, which is probably the highest that they've ever that's given anybody, right? Insane. Are you really? Roman Reigns is a ninety nine yeah, that's that's, mm-hmm. that's really if that's accurate, because I know he was in, he was that in the 
um, the test plays. But if he's really 99 in the game, that's the highest ranked in-game superstar at launch. And then Lesnar at 97, looks like. And then you got Becky Lynch in the Rock at 96. Becky Lynch properly ranked the highest rated woman overall ever. That's kind of why I was concerned a little bit about her path to WrestleMania. She should just have a given. And it, like Becky is deserving of that. The Rock could probably go down at this point. I mean, if they got The Undertaker at 95, you could go with The Rock at 95. No, Steve Austin announced yet. Then, well, no, he's there. They they haven't announced his rating. Probably, yeah. They show like, him off. You'd imagine he'd be higher. Imagine he'd be ninety seven. I'd say. I could see them putting him at the same level as The Rock in ninety six, and just being like, "Ah, uh, Brock's ninety seven. Then, It'd be interesting if they did a ninety eight, just to go between that Brock and and Roman score. That that would be Cena, right? Could be, yeah. I didn't think about Cena. I would say yeah. So. so this is not the type of thing that, like, you know, I don't play the game, so I am not going to be <laughs> factoring in, like, oh, I care so much about exactly what it is. But is it uh, an interesting thing every year when you see these because you do get to see how they view them and that they very easily have somebody up high on, like, a Cody Rhodes, which is, like, you know, self-explanatory. But then when you start to look at the differences between like Damian Priest is an 84 and Dexter Loomis is an 80, they're not that far off. And you would think that Priest having a United States title run and having a nearly undefeated year, the first year that he was on the main roster and all, you'd think that he would potentially be up a little bit higher. But when you start comparing him to somebody like a Lashley at 92, well, there needs to be a gap. So Austin Theory at 82 compared to Damian Priest at 84 or Dexter at 80. Gives you a little sense of the hierarchy in the totem pole. Yeah, and again, like, there's not, we don't need to be overly concerned about this, but it, it is fun to see where they rank in the minds of the game developers and in the minds of the company. So let's uh, talk about this MSG show that's going to be happening where Gunther's next opponent for the Intercontinental Championship is going to be decided in a 20-man battle royal. Now, the breakdown for this doesn't specify a lot of things. It just says, this was from the Twitter account, at the Garden, breaking 20-man battle royal with the winner to face Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship at WWE Road to WrestleMania at MSG on March 12th. So a lot of people are reading into this saying that they think that that means, Oh, they're going to determine who he's going to fight at WrestleMania. I don't think that's the case. What the fuck are you talking about? Are people that stupid? Yeah. Oh, it, that's like the entire thing that I keep saying is people doing that. It's like Hey, the they're going to win the battle Royal. The very first comment Luther later that night, the very first comment on this is what? how is Omas in this? He's supposed to be facing Brock. What are you? I, I can't deal with people. Sometimes, guys. <laughs> Gunther's going to fight the winner later that night in the garden. That's that's what we're doing here. Yeah, that is one of those things that they don't like lay out 100%, but it is the plan, you would assume. Uh, this show on March 12th is a road to WrestleMania show. That's what they're calling the live event tour stuff. That's what they do every single year. So it's just a show in Madison Square Garden. They're going to do a battle royal. The winner is going to fight for the Intercontinental Championship and lose. And that's why you've got names in him like Bobby Lashley. You've got Braun Strowman. You got Karrion Cross and Amos and Loomis and McIntyre and all. They'll do something to probably play into like, you know, maybe Sheamus wins this and has another match against Gunther. Maybe Drew McIntyre ha- wins this and they get to like test out how they would be in the ring or something. But it's not the same as him determining the person he's going to fight at WrestleMania. Wow. They're so silly. They're, they're, people are just like, they're just not bright. It's concerning, man. Like, <laughs> I've never gone to a Madison Square Garden show. 
and I you should yeah that. I'm right here so uh, you should change that you're I, in the city right like you need to change that you should go so I'm considering trying to figure out a means to do that I mean I have to look at my calendar I got to look at the prices and tickets and and everything like that but there's a possibility that I might end up going to that just because hey, house shows can be f- kind of fun they're certainly a hell of a lot cheaper than a lot of other things so if that is the case maybe uh maybe the wife and I will end up going to that. She's adorable. She gives me a thumbs up as I say that. Looking all cute. <laughs> now probably getting embarrassed because I'm talking about her on the podcast. But um, yeah, I mean, that could be interesting. There could be a couple different fun combinations that they do here. So more than anything, the story that I wanted to mention when it comes to that is for anybody that is on that side of things that are all saying like, uh, well, it's got to be Drew McIntyre or Sheamus because they're fighting at WrestleMania. And all. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. It's just a house show. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> They're also doing theory and Seth Rollins in a cage. Here's another. I'm like reading the list of the different things now. Uh, people are like, why don't you put the uh, the Intercontinental Title match at WrestleMania? It's like that's this isn't saying that. Or whatever. Is this going to be televised or on Peacock? No, <laughs> it's not. It's MSG. They it, they just think, like doing good shows like that. I so. guess it's a good reminder that like people don't necessarily get what house shows are. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, look at the different interactions you can see online. A lot of people just don't get a lot of things. <laughs> some people don't even know how to spell some of these characters and stuff. So it's not shocking at all to me that people would think that this road to WrestleMania Battle Royal determining who Gunther fights for the Intercontinental title. It's not shocking at all to me that people are like thinking that that's, you know, determining the WrestleMania opponent. You got to have opponent. You know, Stan Hansen, he said it himself. I, I I see one comment here that suggests Jameis and Drew McIntyre will redo the spot that Luger and Bret Hart did from the Royal Rumble in 94. And I think that's as good a time as any to plug our recent What If podcast where we talk about Lex Luger potentially winning the WWF title at WrestleMania 10. Very good discussion that we had a couple days ago where we break down Babyface Lex Luger's future, if he would have had the championship, heel Lex Luger's future, if he would have had the title, possibilities of if he were to drop it the same night, how he would win it, who he would win it from, where you'd go with Owen, where you'd go with Brett. We kind of did a pretty deep dive on a topic that a lot of people, I'm sure, would look at it and go, well, he didn't. So why are you talking about it? (laughs) Because people are dense. But uh, that was a fun one. So if you are interested in checking out What If... Lex Luger beat Yokozuna and won the championship at WrestleMania 10 instead. Check that out for our main event for this week. And uh, I'll just round out this uh, Gunther story. If you were going to this show, Callum, obviously Gunther is one of your favorites for a house show. And just like a, you know, somebody wins a battle Royal, they have a match with Gunther and that's the end of it. Who would you be rooting for? Pete Dunn. He is not he listed, listed on here, but, but he could very well. But I would also be rooting for Pete Dunn. Um, I'd probably go with either. I'd like to see Sheamus. If I'm going live and I get to watch it live, I want to see one of the Sheamus matches. If we're going that the 20 people that are listed on here are the 20 people, which you know, cards always subject to change and everything. I think I'd go probably Johnny Gargano. That'd be fun. Yeah, I mean, at some point, I want to see. Yeah, at some point, I want to see Gunther against Kofi. I want to see Gunther against Lashley. I want to see Gunther against Finn Balor. Uh, You know, I don't think that uh, Gunther versus Omas is anything I'm really going to be searching for. But you know, I mean, I would much rather see a lot of those things or Santos Escobar or something than to just watch another Ricochet match with him. Ricochet is great and all, but we we've seen it and. Yeah, I like Rick Boogs, but <laughs> I don't think it's going to be as good as uh, as some of those other ones. So if I end up going to this, which uh, who knows, maybe I'm probably going to be rooting for uh, for some Gargano good through action. Yeah, and uh, Dom can eliminate Ray. I see Dom is in this. Mm-hmm. That'll be fun. You got to assume with Ray and uh, Damien and Dominic and Finn all being in this, it's going to be like, all right, Judgment Day is 
doing some pretty good stuff and then like the new days involved in that and you know so on and so forth but um let's go back rewind a little bit and talk about some of the tv things we want to break down that we haven't talked about to finish up our hot tags that we got going on here the episode of monday night raw from this week we had i'm not gonna read every single thing of course but um we had some stuff going on with Sami Zayn starting off the show talking about what happened at Elimination Chamber and you know Kevin Owens is not interested in burying the hatchet quite yet because he did everything for Sami's family, not for Sami. I saw some people com- uh, complaining about this saying like, why didn't they already do the hug yet? I think it makes sense. You gotta slow build it a little bit. You got some time. If they weren't gonna immediately do it in Montreal. Mm-hmm. Then yeah, this was the right call. I think this is also a very good way to explain away the fact that uh, Kevin Owens didn't come out and save Sammy from when the when Jimmy Uso came out and started attacking. Yeah, because Kevin Owens wasn't there to help Sammy win the title. He just waited till the bell rang and then started beating up the bloodline. And it was like, okay, now this is like the mercy play. Like you're gonna get your ass completely whooped now, and then I'll help. So I like that. I uh, can't say I was the biggest fan of some of the other things on this night, like just Oscar beating Nikki and you know whatever. Uh, the Seth Rollins and the Miz thing, not really doing too too much for me. Mustafa Ali beating what do you Dolph Ziggler was funny. Envelope is the Miz envelope thing. I feel needs to well it doesn't need to be. Most likely, it's him saying I'm the host of WrestleMania. I hate how accurate that probably is. I was trying to think of some celebrity shit like, uh, you know, maybe Maurice surprised him with Bad Bunny tickets and it's a way to get Bad Bunny back at WrestleMania or something. But yeah, your your thing is accurate. Miz probably will be the host. Because he said, this is too big to announce just out of the blue. I'm going to schedule time next week to talk about it. Which, of course, is obviously WWE's, hey, let's get people talking about this for a week, and then we can kind of, next week when we advertise Monday Night Raw, Miz is going to reveal what was in the letter, Woo-hoo, what's in the box, you know? The only other thing I could think about would be like, oh, well, they're going to do you know, a high-stakes match at WrestleMania, like Money in the Bank, but they already announced a Money in the Bank pay-per-view. And why would it be the Miz gets a thing from Maurice about that, you know? Hey, honey, then I again, a match at WrestleMania. It is kind of weird that uh, that that would be for you know, like that that would be uh, what you would give them anyway. So, any um, any predictions on that, Callum? You think Miz is going to be host, or you think it's going to be someone else? Tony, you know my answer. Move on. <laughs> your answer is you can't wait for it, and this <laughs> is your so this is the thing that you are more that- looking forward to than anything else. I get it. <laughs> My answer is the same thing that it's been with the Miz for the vast majority of his career, which is who cares since 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 uh, at least 2016. But uh, yeah, yeah, it'll probably be the hosting thing. That's it. he doesn't have any clear match that no. he made for WrestleMania. I, I know I'm in the minority, but maybe you and Callum would agree with me. I'd rather the Miz just be in a match than be in seven crummy backstage segments. It kind of depends to me. The last couple times they've had these hosts, they really haven't done much with them. It's mostly been like two quick segments. So if he just introduces, hey, everybody, welcome to WrestleMania, it's kind of pointless. And I really don't even think that they need anybody to do that at all. So I'd rather Miz just kind of be in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. But maybe it's something else. I mean, who knows? Maybe they do have some kind of a... I don't know. Maybe it's a fucking tie-in with Miz and Mrs. or something for all we know. But that is a thing. Uh, Bronson Reed beat Chad Gable. Uh, Austin Theory beat Edge to retain the United States title and further indicate it's Edge versus Finn Balor at WrestleMania. And <laughs> yep, as as everyone <sighs> everyone should have known. This uh, isn't as I mean, this isn't something that I'm interested in. We've talked about this for months of me saying 
Can we move on? Can we move on? Can we move on? I hope we don't get too close to WrestleMania and it ends up being that they're still doing this. And then look, it's, it's happening. But on top of that, even more of a downer to me, they did this thing. We didn't get the chance to talk about this on the, uh, the hot tags last week. Cause it hadn't happened yet, but randomly on SmackDown last week, Bray Wyatt just goes, Hey, I'm, uh, I'm going to fight either Lashley or Lesnar. And it was like, what? The fuck? What are you talking about? Yeah. And right. now we talked about it on the Elimination Chamber stuff that we were like, this just comes completely out of nowhere and all. But now we got a follow up for that, which is, yeah, okay, it's not 100% confirmed, but by all accounts, Lashley is going to be fighting Bray Wyatt. And what's going to happen with Brock Lesnar? Well, they answered it on Raw. Fucking Omas? Huh? <laughs> This is where I get back to the point I mentioned earlier, where I said this past week has done more to hurt my anticipation for WrestleMania than to actually build anything. I mean, anything at all more positively for it. And it's not anything at fault for the Sami Zayn thing. It's not anything for the Cody Rhodes thing. Those are the parts that I'm interested in, even if I think that they've, they didn't do it as well as they should with the Jey Uso thing and all, but it's just now you went from, okay, you got those two things and the Logan Paul thing. That could be fun. That could be cool. I wasn't feeling Asuka and Bel Air. I wasn't feeling Ripley and Charlotte. But hey, if all the rest of the matches are cool, then you do that. This week, we got confirmation of Edge and Balor for the most part. We got Omas and Lashley. We got this, or uh, Omas, Omas and, and um, Lesnar. We got this Lashley and Wyatt thing that comes out of absolutely nowhere and has nothing at all that leads to it. There's no connection whatsoever. And we also got, hey, Becky and Lita are here and Trish is probably going to pop up, but never mind. She actually left and we're going to wait and do that again. And it seems like we're going to get Trish against Bailey in just a regular match. And then Becky and Lita against Dakota Kai and Io Sky, and then probably Ronda and Shayna and maybe some other people too. Man, now we're at a point that almost an entire night's worth of this show. These two shows are matches that I'm like, fuck, I don't care about that. <laughs> you know? Look, yeah, it, oh, go ahead, Cal. I was like, it's, it's, it's hard to get excited for a number of the matches that we've never seen too much of, or I was like, I'm, I'm totally down with the idea of Becky and Lita teaming up to take on the tag champions and, we know who else is going to get involved. So it's hard to get super excited when you know who you we, you already know who the winners of that match is going to be, let alone who's going to be in it. But the the Omos, well, the Omos and Bray Wyatt matches are the two big ones. And that's just fundamentally due to the fact that Omos sucks and Bray Wyatt sucks. So I don't really want to see either of them uh, wrestling in general, let alone wrestling at WrestleMania. I think the Lesnar one, again, if it, if it goes ahead, it's Omos Lesnar. I'm still holding out hope that... They must be swerving us some way and just making us worry that this match can happen. So when we eventually find out who Brock Lesnar is actually facing at WrestleMania, we'll get more excited about it. That's but, what I told Tony. I said, like, the only way I see this going is Brock Lesnar shows up, beats up Omos so embarrassingly bad that that takes care of. Because remember, we were talking about was last week or the week before. Tony kept going, yeah, but what about Omos? How are they going to do the hurt business with Lashley and you still have Omos? Maybe Le- maybe Lesnar just takes care of Omos on Raw and we can worry about what happens next once that's done. Yeah, yeah. the only reason I think that they would go the full way with Lesnar and Omos is because they're so desperate to get that, you know, that iconic shot of Lesnar lifting this giant man up onto his shoulders for an F5 and hitting it. Mm-hmm. Just like, okay, this whole match is built up for that single moment. And frankly... There's been enough of WWE's in WWE's recent history to suggest that that's something that they would do for WrestleMania. I really think that that's the case. I think that they are quite literally saying we'll come back to Lashley Lesnar at Backlash. What do we do in the meantime then? And then they looked at the different people that they still have. You know, they had like a spreadsheet where they're like, well, we got Logan Paul's already with Seth Rollins, so we can't do anything with them. Uh, you know, Austin Theory is going to do this thing with John Cena, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I think that they said, well, you know, I mean, it makes sense if Omos goes up against him because, hey, look, 
Omas has the MVP connection and we want to get the Hurt Business back together and it's a big, big dude against Brock and doesn't that seem like a marquee thing? It's this super giant against Brock and he gets to pick him up. I really think that that's all they think. They want to see giant versus Brock. Brock picks up giant. And then that can be MVP is the go between between Omas and Lashley and Brock. The thing that confuses me even more than any of that, where the fuck does Bray Wyatt come in here? Because We're if that's that tonight when they do the fireflies on house, well, if that's what they are like trying to avoid is to just be like, well, we'll come back to the Lashley thing again. We'll milk that for like the ninth fucking month or whatever it is that they've done it. No, I mean, it'd be full, a full year to keep going back to this and all, but, um, then you, where do you go with Lashley? Because, uh, like if you go with Lashley and Lesnar at like backlash, then Wyatt just decides to fuck off and he was just there for nothing. Cause you have nothing else for him. And that makes me a little bit worried too, because then I think, Oh fuck, do they have nothing for Wyatt? Has this really quite literally been, why don't you go out and cut your cryptic promos and we'll figure something out. And month after month, I mean, he came in what October or was it September? October, uh, October. What's he done? He fought in glow in the dark paint. He had one match. That was like Mm -hmm. three minutes long or something. It was was longer than that. Unfortunately, (laughs) where all the leading up to it, it was like, Hey, I'm kind of a bad guy, but I'm kind of not. And I'm going to just, you know, speak in riddles and all. And uncle Howdy is being teased and all. And we were all just assuming, Hey, it's uncle Howdy versus Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania. Cause it's obviously the thing that you do or a tag team match or anything along those lines. And for them to just be like, nah, they're actually, they're cool with each other. All right. There's no drama then. We don't and know then, that yet. I, I just think that. I'm I'm worried that they're going to do something where they they're doing the Lashley and Wyatt thing as like, well, we don't know what to do and we don't want to do Howdy versus Wyatt and we don't know what else to do with Lesnar. We don't know what else, all that other kind of stuff. I'm really worried now that this game plan for WrestleMania is let's just do Lashley versus Wyatt and Uncle Howdy can cost Wyatt and then we can do that. And then they just go back to Lashley and Lesnar. You know what I mean? I mean, I'd rather that than Wyatt beating Lashley. Even still, both scenarios, I think, are just like, oh, you're, but, uh, you're dawdling and bad. you're wasting time yeah, for nothing. Yeah, it's all bad. But anything that you can possibly imagine between Lashley and uh, Wyatt, nothing is good for, to, good to me. I mean, again, not a people are talking about this, but where's Alexa, where's Alexa Bliss gone? Yeah, that's, Alexa that's, just that's disappeared. That's where I was trying to get to, where yeah. I think something happened where, because Bliss claims, or, or someone had claimed, I think it was might have been Meltzer, that like they knew Bliss was going to take time off. And is it so much, is she so integral to the story that... You know, you can't just do the fucking story without, um, without well, Alexa Bliss being there. Even still, it's like if she is so integral to the story and all, what would she have done? Because if she just needs to show up and like pick a side between Howdy and Wyatt or something, she could have done that. I don't know what's happening for why she's taking time off, but if she is this is probably one of the worst times that you could do that. And then to just be like, all right, well, I'm going to skip mania and I'm going to skip this feud and the story. And we're going to dodge it. And we're going to change Lashley. And we're going to change Lesnar. We're going to change this and that. And that if I all was there, these, I'd, skip, I'd want to skip this as well, <laughs> but she seems to want to be a part of it even more. So, you know, so that's, what's weirder is you finally start getting this going after all this time and being like, oh, I liked my character better then. And then you take time off and you, it all gets derailed. Like, did they just have a meeting two weeks ago and they went, you know what? Fuck all the plans. <laughs> Let's take all these different puzzle pieces and rearrange them. Kind of feels like it. 
and it doesn't give me a whole lot of faith in the rest of the wrestlemania card because now i'm like all right well if this is how they're approaching it we very well could just get some kind of like yeah we're all assuming that it's like drew mcintyre and sheamus and gunther for the intercontinental title for all we know they just decide on smackdown tonight they're like you know what it's uh it's fucking boogs we're bringing him over to SmackDown and he's fighting him. And then we'd be like, this doesn't make any sense because the, the Bray Wyatt thing came out of nowhere. I don't have a lot of faith. <laughs> Starting to really, really look to me like they're doing the same thing they've done the past couple of years where they went, we got the Cody and Roman thing. That's your mania. Oh, Logan Paul's wrestling. Fuck yeah. Oh, John Cena's potentially wrestling. Oh, I mean, we got three matches. That's all we need. We're gonna get Lita back. Historically, four matches. <laughs> you know, like that's historically WrestleMania is always built around like three main matches that make sense. It's just it just appears like more and more each year, the rest of the card is just being pulled out of thin air. Like they're really taking this idea of nothing matters except for the time frame leading up to Mania. And then they're going, yeah, but nothing matters on the way to Mania. It's only what matters on Mania. Like we've said before about like Bianca Belair versus Sasha Banks. Go back in the archives, listen to those old episodes. The entire time that that feud's going on, all of us here are sitting there going, damn it, this feud is not good. And they're really banking on the idea of, but they'll have a good match at Mania. And then you go, you go the past two years or so. And even when it comes to Mania, we've got more than enough examples of that. And then sadly, a lot of examples of, and they didn't have a, even a good match at Mania. And then a lot of people go, yeah, well, fuck it. Not every single match needs to matter. Then you go, God damn, how many excuses are you going to make? Nothing matters until you get up to Mania, but then nothing matters on the way to Mania, but then nothing matters at Mania. Yep. So then nothing matters. <laughs> yep. Then why, why are we watching this? You know? So this raw episode made me just feel like damn it damn it damn it all across the board we didn't get the trash thing to make anything spark we didn't get i didn't want edge to win the united states title but it was like well if they do that maybe something interesting is along the way and it's like nah it's fucking finn balor's like i'm not done with you yet well we know you haven't been done with him an entire year and a half we get it blah (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's the best way that i can say it it's just that ah. i'm still i'm still holding out faith for it. i mean tonight Cody roman will be good and maybe we get somewhere where things make sense they're gonna have to do a lot of heavy lifting tonight to try to convince me that anything at all going on with this lashley and wyatt thing will be worth a damn and for anybody that's wondering too no i do not subscribe to the idea of but they're both former world champions and they're big stars and all that. So you just put the two big stars against each other and it already sells itself. Now the problem with Wyatt is that he needs to finish whatever this story is, this fucking howdy story. Like he needs to finish it. And then let's start getting you back into play with the regular guys. You know, the a match against Lashley out of thin air isn't what he needs to be doing at Mania. If Uncle Howdy is his whole story for Mania, he needs to do that there. Or he needs to... The Brock thing I wasn't mad at because then you could go, I was supposed to fight you seven years ago and it's him writing a wrong. Lashley comes out of nowhere. The argument I would say to anybody that's saying, all you have to do is say... This is a guy that's a big star. This is a guy that's a big star. You don't need any build. It's mania. You're going with that. The end. I would say, what if right now WWE just announced it's Rey Mysterio versus Braun Strowman at mania? Would you be excited? Would you be confused? Would you be whatever? And if anybody goes, oh, that doesn't make any sense. That's exactly what they just did with the Bray Wyatt thing. Do not tell me that they did anything. Anything that remotely hinted towards Bray Wyatt's going to go up against either Brock or Bobby. They didn't. They're just pulling this out of nowhere. So, or that they had it planned and they waited and then they just pulled the trigger this way. 
or they didn't have this planned whatsoever and they just said, I guess we're going in with this direction. If you are super into that idea, you have to admit, just be honest. You have to admit the only reason that you're super into it is because you like those two guys. Otherwise, me pitching Dolph Ziggler versus Sheamus to happen at WrestleMania right now is exactly the same. Be fair. Admit it. We will admit it. You just heard Cal a minute ago say he's not interested in this because he doesn't like Bray Wyatt. And he's not interested in the Omas thing because he's not a big fan of Omas. Mm-hmm. So, you know, cards on the table. Like, I don't think an Omas match against Brock Lesnar is interesting because, yeah. Well, let me put it this way. I don't think an Omas match against Brock Lesnar is interesting for WrestleMania. If you were to tell me that that's going to happen on Monday Night Raw, I'd be like, oh, that's kind of neat. I want to see him pick up Omas and throw him. That's I just don't want. Match. I just don't. Yeah, it's a Saudi Arabia, just random thing. I just don't want to see six weeks building that up. And then them to sidestep and detour all this other stuff along with it. And, you know, all the cards crumble, all the house cards. And on top of that, to know the biggest show of the year with arguably your biggest guy. Is just uh, a moss. That's weak. That shows a lack of effort or just a, a disconnect in my mind. So not into it. Um, any other thoughts on Monday Night Raw for you guys? Nope. No, I can move on from that. Let's talk about some NXT then. We got some stuff like Ilya Dragunov beat Trick Williams. Dyad beating Chase University, which afterward Duke Hudson was yelling at Thea Hale saying she needs to grow up. And uh, is this a university or a charity? Tyler Bate came out for some reason to be like, hey, thanks, everybody. Remember, I've got this gimmick that I kind of put on hold. And (laughs) and they did not give a fuck. No. Yeah, they did not. Um, He's going to fight Chip Williams next week. I still think he'll be in a ladder match for the North American title at Sin Deliver. Dunn fights fighting Carmelo Hayes next week. Oh. Didn't he? Did he beat Trick Williams this week? Or last week? No, Trick, no, Trick Williams is facing um, Ilya Dragunov. Okay, yeah, Dragunov beat Williams. Listen, it all blends together. I try to pay as little attention to NXT as I can. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I'd be down for Melo and uh, Bate because they're both great. We got uh, some follow-up when it came to the Drew Gulak story. He told Mackenzie Mitchell, look, I came to NXT with this the idea in mind of like finding the best talent and all, and it's not uh, Hank Walker. <laughs> he basically just said, like, Hank Walker is a nice guy. Not good. Charlie Dempsey, he good. I like Dempsey. And... Uh, yeah, it's, it's good enough as an explanation as you can get. I'm curious where they go with this, but it's not the biggest story in the world. So, uh, If you're going to put Hank Walker with somebody as like another person, to me, put him in Chase University. Why not? Andre Chase does have that kind of style. But I don't know. Because I feel like Chase is tied up it would have to be like someone who isn't doing much of anything right now. And there's not many other like mentor type characters that are out there that at least right now, I mean, maybe they plan on bringing somebody in or something, but um, yeah, I mean, I like Gulak in NXT. I think he makes a lot more sense there than just being a guy on the house show circuit on SmackDown. Can't say I'm super digging as much of the Gigi Dolan attacks JC Jane after her match with Andy Hartwell and they're just kind of continuing on. It's it's a little basic for me, but we know where it's all heading. Um, any pros or cons when it comes to that side of that? I know. I thought it was fine. Like basic, yes, but that's not always a bad thing. Yeah, I think I think the the crowd seems to be into it, so I guess that's the best thing going for it. We got the Tony D'Angelo stuff with Von Wagner. Um, that is going to be 
a jailhouse street fight between Tony D'Angelo and Dijak at NXT Roblox. Um, you know, the the name, obviously, it's it's just a name. You know, I mean, it's a street fight. They're just calling it jailhouse street fight. I wouldn't have expected jailhouse to be the term that they would have used for it, but D'Angelo against Dijak fighting in that way could potentially be the end of that feud. Maybe they end up moving on to something else. You mentioned the idea of like a, a ladder match thing. I, at this point, I'm expecting since Von Wagner has been thrown into this, uh, this whole feud, Wesley versus Von Wagner versus Tony D'Angelo versus Dijak in a ladder match. Maybe, oh, there's some people, I don't know. What was the, uh, how many people were in the one with EC3 and Lars Sullivan and all? Six? Yeah, that was a six. Oh, yeah, that was a six there. So, I mean, this is this is four, five if you count stacks, but he probably wouldn't be in the match. He would just be, you know, interfering. Maybe we throw two more people in there. Maybe we just keep it a four. You got any uh, projections? Hard to say because like Oro Mensa was in the last one. He's falling off the face of the earth, though. So. Like, yeah, he even I think he even lost like a level up match against a new guy or something recently. They dropped him. He's still doing his uh, vignettes and everything. It's like the life and the party thing or whatever that whatever that shit gimmick was. Wasn't that uh, Casey and Casey? <laughs> it's Oro uh, Casey now. <laughs> uh, it could honestly be, you know, they they could feel itchy and throw gender in there for some reason. They could they could literally do anything. I mentioned gender. He lost his bid to win the NXT Championship that against Braun Breaker. So boring. Yeah, I, that's boring match so I've hard. ever seen in my life. I can't tell you a single thing that happened in it, and I you don't think- even remember what I was doing. I probably was like washing dishes or something, which sounds so boring. But it's like, uh, uh, you know, it's not catching my even attention. The closing spear was just like he barely jogged a couple steps and tackled them. It's just boring. It's just. It's just the constant reminder that this guy was WWE champion for six months or so. It's the fact that he's he's never had a good match, like never. Like, like I, I mean, it's like good. I mean, when it's a good match, I mean a match that you might just say like, "Hey, that I might go back and check out that Jinder Mahal match at some other point." It's like no one's ever said that ever. His best match, undoubtedly, is the one where he wins the belt. And the most I remember from that match is Randy Orton's face after dumping one of the Singh brothers on the back of their heads on that announce table. Some of these people in this NXT roster really have just been pushed aside. Like, we haven't done anything with the Creed brothers. We haven't done anything with the rest of Indu Share. This Jinder Mahal thing just kind of came out of nowhere. And and they're not even doing anything at Roadblock. Like, even if this was your Roadblock match, mm-hmm. okay, Jinder's a former WWE champion. Sure. Right. But it's really, they're just like, hey, we can't say it's in delivery yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Give us one more week, Carmelo. Yeah. And Carmelo, of course, he had a couple appearances here and there and nothing um, super crazy or anything. We also got Dabakato explaining a little bit more of the most basic thing that we could possibly have asked for for this feud, which was, I'm upset i've got my feelings hurt when you went to nxt and you didn't have me tag along so nothing super fun or interesting about that feud it is the cookie cutter explanation i used to be your partner you went on and did something without me now i'm mad we'll get dabakato versus apollo cruz maybe it's at stand and deliver maybe it's a roadblock i don't know it was a roadblock they would have announced it Roblox is Tuesday. Is this Tuesday? Yeah. Come Tuesday? Wait. I thought it was... uh. It's Tuesday. I, I cover NXT every week. Because Tuesday is the 28th. Isn't Roblox the beginning of the month? Is of it? March? Are we not already in March? Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm clearly not <laughs> here. Yeah, I was like, I'm pretty sure that we have one more week for them to announce All right, other then, things. Then it might actually be a Roblox. Yeah, it's March 7th. Which means they might actually give Breaker a match at Roadblock. Maybe. Maybe it's just going to be one another one of those things that we've gotten with Braun Breaker before where almost every single person he's feuded with, it's been do a match, 
but then do a follow-up match. Grayson Waller, of course, got the follow-up match. We've got the Joe Casey has a two-shot thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But he can't, Jinder can't get a follow-up because that was so definitive and so clean, so boring. There's nothing to give Jinder a follow-up. I'd say it's unlikely Bron Breaker will have a, a match at Roadblock because, um, well, you've already got, like, Satamora versus Roxanne Perez on that show, so I think that'll probably be the main event of it. I'm a little bit shocked that they're doing that instead of waiting and just doing that at Santa Deliver. Well, we gotta get the belt on Zoe, bro. Like, you expecting it's Zoe and Roxanne? Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, they did do the thing where Zoe was like, you know, hey, if I was fighting her, then, you know, that kind of thing. But Stephanie Stratton did another thing. She denied attacking Nikita Lyons. Alba Fire beat Ivy Nile. They did a very, very temporary thing with Tatum Paxley being a little bit too afraid to be ringside. And she just was. <laughs> so it was like, that was kind of pointless. My favorite, my favorite bit of that whole thing was Tatum Paxley's afraid. And then she looks at the Diamond Mine flag. As if Diamond Mine means anything, first of all. And second mm-hmm. of all, as if she meant anything to Diamond Mine. She's never even been an official member. <laughs> well, I, I just thought it was like, well, first of all, it's, the, it's unfortunate to hear about the Nikita Lanz is going to be out for close to a year, if it seems like. You know. Yeah, I wanted to touch base on that, because uh, I don't know if she's ever going to be champion like we thought she'd be. I mean, she's now multiple times that she's been put on hold because she's kind of injury prone, it seems. Uh, the other thing that I took away from it was it's so blindingly obvious that Tatum Paxley's the one that attacked Nikita Lyons. Because she was watching the... Uh, That's the reason she was nervous, is because like she no, she doesn't want Ivy to find out that she's the one that took her out. What was she watching? I, I guess I missed that detail. She's well, watching the like, interview with Nikita. Uh. Yes, yeah, she was watching that, yeah, and then just, that's why she was nervous and jittery when Ivy came uh, to see her and stuff like that. A lot of people were time thinking, oh, she's just scared of Alba Fire and Isla Dawn, and just going, no, nah, it's because she, she took out Nikita Lanz and she's worried that people are going to find out about it. Mm. My thing is, if if she was coming back in three months, maybe even six, I'd allow it, but are people going to remember no. this little detail or care in a year? I also think that they don't even necessarily, I mean, obviously they don't know how long she's going to be out and everything. I think that they don't have anything in mind and they don't even necessarily plan on following it up because they get very easily, if she's going to be out for like an entire year, she just comes back and they're like, Hey, we haven't seen her in a while. They're definitely going to make something out of it because they're really harping on this whole, have you heard anything about who attacked you? So they're going to do something with it, but she is out for a year. So that's going to be. It's going to be rough. Oh, uh, we got the Gallus is going to fight pretty deadly. They had a cake. That's a stupid segment. <laughs> and the only other thing was uh, another stupid thing. Uh, Fallon Henley apologized to Kiana. Kiana James yeah. then said, yeah, it's okay. It's okay to be jealous. And Brooks is not answering Fallon's phone calls. So that, Classic story continues. <laughs> Tune in next week, you know. The real Fallon's takeaway... The this. Fallon's the heel in this, right? I mean, she oh. is obviously not supposed to be. She's supposed to be like, ah, oh, I'm trying to do the right thing, but whatever. But it's not <laughs> written well, <laughs> so it is kind of coming across and like, maybe stop butting in, you know? <laughs> Just let it happen. Well, no, all you have to do is have... It ends the same way I thought it would end with it's going to be Fallon and Brooks. Like, it's just the, they're taking the long way around. You think it's going to be that she's interested in Brooks Jansen? Yeah. And then, you know, Kiana can be revealed as a bad guy all along. And maybe her brother isn't her brother. Maybe it's her stepbrother. Maybe it's a. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> You're starting to go down a different rabbit hole here. <laughs> Are you starting to get into uh, some uh, some banger bros territory? We're gonna that get um, is what and- advertising with their acting. Okay, that is what's <laughs> happening here. Uh, Who are you casting as your supporting characters? In this? 
That's a different podcast. <laughs> uh, well, Josh Briggs is going to be sitting there going, "Hey, I can, I can contribute." You know, <laughs> the takeaway from the end of NXT at the very least, and this is the thing that I found more interesting than most of the other stuff that happened on this episode. Grayson Waller interrupted the production truck and said that he was taking over and that he wants to have a Grayson Waller effect with Shawn Michaels on it at roadblock. And again, so many people going, Oh my God, I can't believe that they're going to build up a match and he's going to fight Shawn Michaels at uh state of deliver. And it's like, uh, I don't think that's happening. And the current thing that is going around now is that this is somehow going to lead to dragon Lee popping up and, fighting on behalf of Shawn Michaels. It could be as simple as he's threatening to fight Shawn and Dragon Lee comes out and saves the day and then that's what they do. Could be something else. I don't know. Kind of makes sense a little bit to me. Not makes sense in like the clearly Dragon Lee is going to fight Grayson Waller, but you know, hey, if you want to get Dragon Lee on the card, a match against Grayson Waller, marquee match. There you go. I think if you're going to, if it's leading to Dragon Lee, it's Hey, you want a big match so bad? I'm gonna give you a major match against our next big signing. In the same way, except he's a heel, like they gave Sammy Nakamura, where it was just like, "Hey, you want to fight our new guy?" And it's, "Oh my God, it's Shinsuke Nakamura!" Yay! That and that could be a way to go, but I still think the right thing to do is Giant Gargano. I hadn't really considered the uh, Dragon Lee aspect. I didn't uh, either, but he brought it up, so I wanted no, but to no, at least answer it. No, but that would no, be a good way to go. I can see that being the case, because fundamentally, I'm just, like, like it, can't, it can't be Sean. Like, just it just can't be Sean, because he can't waste this his re- return match on Grayson Waller. As much as I am actually in fan of Grayson Waller and think that he's, like, the upgrade on the Miz, uh, I definitely wouldn't put him as uh, Michael's opponent. Like, fight. you can find like twenty guys on the roster that are better off than uh, than what it would be. So anyway, let's uh, round things out here with the AEW talk. Let's talk about Dynamite, the episode that I already already said. A lot of it didn't really catch my attention, so I can't talk about some like specifics about. You know, I wasn't really like glued to my TV screen for Soraya against Sky Blue, or the acclaimed beating big bill and Lee Moriarty or whatever thing. But, um, I did see a portion of orange Cassidy against Wheeler Yuta. That was fun. Not at all surprising considering the two of them. Uh, yeah. It was, it was an excellent opener. And yeah, I, 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 there's things about Will Yuta in that. I understand that he's obviously not the most vocally charismatic guy on the roster, but he, when he gets like, those fired up spots when he's doing those big kickouts towards the end of a match. That's when you go, okay, he doesn't, he has in ring charisma and that's enough for me right now. Yeah. I more matches like this, please more orange Cassidy is forced into taking it serious matches. I love the tickle, butt and the stupidity of putting him in there with Dan Housen and Jared and this one and that one, but more of this where we're forced to go, okay, that's why he's champion, because he's actually good. So where do you guys think that this leads next? Um, I think that Claudio would be a good start next. It'd be interesting to see how they do that. Well, considering the fact they are doing Ring of Honor taping soon, so... They, they might move more down that direction, but I think the direction is more interesting with um, Blackpool Combat Club because I think they're all outside of Danielson, at least for the time being. I think they're turning heel. Oh, yeah, they're definitely all heel. Yeah. So we'll be interested to see what direction they take with that. And uh, Orange Cassidy, I mean, Orange Cassidy just takes on anybody, and that's kind of the, the, the beauty of Orange Cassidy is like someone says, I want the All Night Championship, and he goes, whatever, and just fights them for the t- and defends the title against them. So you can really do anything with Orange. He's versatile. I mean, you know how I feel when it comes to Orange Cassidy. Like, 
that guy's one of my absolute favorites of the roster he's been since the start. So, you know, you put him against somebody who is interesting, I'm going to enjoy it. You put him against somebody who I've never seen before, I'm still going to probably enjoy it. He's just a, he's a top-notch act for me. So, um, Orange against Claudio. I'm, I'm fucking down for that. <laughs> yeah, but if they do Orange against Claudio, then I just, I will always want Claudio to be more of a champion. Do you want him to actually potentially beat Orange yeah. Cassidy? Yeah, even though he's got the, the title, title, that's fine. If they do it for the ROH title, that's fine. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, this match wasn't for the pure championship, as well as the All Atlantic Championship. So, yeah, as long as it's only one title on the line, that's fine. Hmm. Now, when it comes to the Soraya stuff, I basically have the exact same opinion that I did before. I think that we are going to be getting now that we know we, you know, we'll talk about this next week when it comes to the um, Revolution pay-per-view predictions but we're gonna get a triple threat it's gonna be ruby soho and uh soraya against uh jamie hater so kind of still working into that idea that ruby should be turning and she she would uh, she should be joining up with ruby or <laughs> with ruby <laughs> ah with uh soraya and with um tony storm still there you go. You know how to do words. I'm reading too many things at the same time. I'm getting a lot of messages from a lot of people at the same time here. So I still think that's going to be the case. I still think that Willow Nightingale is going to end up being a part of the like AEW homegrown talent side of things. This didn't do anything for me. Them beating Sky Blue, but yeah, it's a sacrificial lamb type thing. Yeah, it's just one of those. It's just one of those squash matches. I will say that um, uh, Sri needs to get better. So yeah, she she is she is still very rusty. Um, but we'll see. I mean, the, the the advantage of the triple threat match is that she doesn't have to be involved all the time, and you can have just extended periods of just Ruby Soho versus Jamie Hayter, and it'll be fine. So they they can hide her weaknesses, of which there seem to be quite a few right now. I'm still hopeful she gets better and gets to where she wants to go because right now it feels very blah, and I want to be more excited about this. Jarrett and Lethal won the tag team battle royale. There you are. Damn right they did. The uh, third team out of the four that will be in that four way for the tag team titles at Revolution. Uh, yeah, I, I have to like pull my hands up and admit when I was wrong. Uh, Jeff Jarrett's been like awesome since he's joined AEW. <laughs> he's so good. He's so. G- <laughs> 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 like I know that because I, I was just like you know you, you can't help but be blinded by what happened in TNA and all that stuff associated with him but the fact is he he knows what to do he gets heat like no like virtually any nobody else in the company besides like mjf and maybe a couple of others but he like this whole ending segment like the battle royal was just battle royal like pretty much nothing and the less we say about how inconsequential was the open war in this match the better but um at least they're getting a match on rampage that'll be good but i think that you once it got down to Jarrett and Lethal against Trent Beretta, then it got really, really good. Because essentially those two being cocky heels, like thinking that they were constantly eliminating Trent Beretta and then him skinning the cat constantly and then doing the Fargo strut all the time and it comes down to the final two. And Satnam Singh is just carrying the two around the ring as well. Again, it's a little bullshit that he's allowed to stay at ringside, but then again, who's going to get rid of a seven-foot-plus giant <laughs> who's surrounding the ring? But, uh, yeah, I think it makes sense that those two are in the match there. Like, they've been really, really good since they uh, since they came together as a tag team, so I think it's, uh, it's a smart choice to have them as the second heel team. So we just need to find out who the other babyface team is. And, and obviously they have their face? connection with the Acclaim from before and everything too, so... Oh, yeah. Who do you think it is? I'm I'm still uh, betting on FTR. I am no longer betting on FTR. I believe the Jokers of next week's Casino Battle Royale, and, and maybe even the winners at Revolution, Darby Allen and Sting. That's good. That'd be a good choice as well. I think Sting and Jeff Jarrett in a match again. <laughs> Damn right for the, for the tag team titles. Let's go. What you want to see, isn't it, Tony? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I mean, there's worse with... options for sure. 
I mean, best friends after this angle would be a good choice as well, just because of the way that this match ended to get there, um, to get another opportunity at it. And then, obviously, you can't go wrong with putting a team like either the Lucha Bros or Top Flight in there either. So there are definitely options. I'll tell you who won't be, and we can maybe just parlay this into something else. The Hardys. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jeff Hardy has his uh, license suspended. For and 10 years. Yeah, it's... Uh, oh, in well. some ways, I mean, I think he's still kind of being left uh, uh, let go a little bit easier than he, he should. He won't be serving any jail time. They gave him 38 days credit as time served. Um, the good news is case is closed. Matt Hardy says he's in a good place. Matt's always said that, though. Matt's always said that. I'm just trying to say words here, Cal. Um, Matt says he's in a good place. Matt says his wife is very happy with where Jeff is at right now. I don't think he'll come back to AEW. I don't know if that's the best place for him to be. But stranger things have happened. Um. Yeah, I'll just like echo a tweet that I saw. I can't remember the, who put the tweet out there, but um, someone saying that essentially anyone who wants what's best for Jeff Hardy and want Jeff Hardy to recover and to get over his bad habits, all those people should not want him to return to any wrestling company probably ever again at this point. Because fundamentally his style of wrestling and what he has to do and what he thinks he has to do to get over and stay over um, is not conducive to a healthy lifestyle. I went back and watched Jeff Hardy versus Bobby Fish in the Owen Hart tournament. And Jeff, his body is just beaten up, man. Like, I maybe in the moment you forget, but like watching it back, he's really moving slowly. It's not... Like producing a fun Jeff Hardy match. Maybe it's just time to hang it up, you know? It's not like he hasn't had a long career. Hasn't accomplished everything that he needs to accomplish yeah. and all. He's he's had a way longer career than anyone probably could have ever expected when he's when when like when you see those matches back in like ninety nine and two thousand that he was having. Or when you see certain struggles that he's had, like the money in the yeah. bank that didn't go that way, or the sting match in TNA, or you know. Yeah. The fact that he did wrestle to a, you can even say to a good level until like the late tw- like twenty ten to early twenty twenties. That's like, it's pretty pretty remarkable. So and, then, uh, final thing from this was the Evil Uno and John Moxley match. God, Evil, they bled a lot. Man. Yeah, Evil Uno bleeding a fucking ton. <laughs> Where was he bleeding from? The, the mask. Well, <laughs> I mean, he's definitely bleeding from the mask, but like, was it his nose, or did he had to go cut around his eye? What? It had to be. It had to be from the from the head. Yeah, it was probably from the forehead. I think they ripped up the mask a little bit so he could bleed from the head. Hmm. I just remember turning around at one point. And I'm like, oh, there's a lot of blood around here. Moxley must have. Wait, shit! It's Evil Uno. <laughs> you know? Don't worry, but, Moxley got there. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's Wednesday night. <laughs> you know what that means? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to get a uh, Texas death match at uh, Revolution between those. Mm-hmm. And this is something that obviously did more to build the idea of that that's going to be a bloody match. And I'm down for that. We're going to be talking about it, like our excitement levels for different things stuff going forward. And that's going to be high, high up on my list of Revolution matches that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. That, that's a... They've, they've built this story very well from that. They've taken the um, the misfortune of what happened to Paige a couple of months ago and turned it into a really, really hot angle. So I'm excited to see the blow off for it. I still don't know who's going to win just yet. but Still banking on Moxley's got to lose. <laughs> and we will obviously talk about that. Oh, or, you want to go ahead? Well, I'd say like I'd say like we have decided to skip over the two best things that happened on this show, which were the Ricky Starks promo and the MJF promo. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> so Ricky Starks um, 
came to the ring and he had essentially an open contract in his hand saying that, okay, Jericho doesn't want to fight me at Revolution, so I've got an open contract, I'm going to fight at Revolution, so whoever comes out to take the open challenge, uh, come out now. And then Jericho comes out and he's acting like he's not going to take the take the open contract. So Peter Avalon like runs into the ring to basically so like, okay, I'm going to sign the contract, I'm going to get a match at Revolution. And Jericho just immediately wipes him out with Judas Effect. Just like that was just a nice little funny touch to get uh, Peter Avalon's time on TV. And then um, Jericho essentially, essentially uh, Starks reverse psychologies Jericho to get him to not only sign the contract, but to add an addendum into the contract, which says that the Jericho Appreciation Society will be banned from ringside. And so, and then Jericho walks by saying, nobody outsmarts Chris Jericho. And then Rick <laughs> Stark just stares at the character, the camera, like dead down the camera and just starts winking. Mm-hmm. Just like doing like kissy face and stuff like that. It's just like, yeah, it's uh, that was that was a lot of fun. That made me actually excited for the match after this feud has been a bit like meandering all over the place, but I was actually I'm now excited to see how this happens. And I have a sneaking suspicion that Jericho's gonna win. Really? Yep, because well I mean it's following the same pattern as the other ones, so if he <laughs> loses it's just copy and paste the same thing. Well, I've I've kind of got the mindset of Jericho signed the contract saying that Jericho Appreciation Society will be banned at ringside. So he'll find someone that's not part of the Jericho Appreciation Society. Hmm. I don't know who that will be, but I can imagine that's a way to have Starks lose without, like, you know, burying the guy and moving him on to another feud instead. Um, and then the MJF promo is just a work of that's art. That's right. Yeah. I, I don't know why I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I forgot that we didn't cover that. Yeah. Which seems like it could be rooted in reality for part of it, which is, Mm. that's a shame to hear uh, that he and um, Naomi, what's her name? I think Naomi Rosenblum, I think uh, that he had been engaged to her and it seems like that might not have worked out. They used that to build a little bit more where this promo was entirely about the idea of you've got something more than I have. I only have this championship. So I'm going to be fighting for that more than anything else. You've got a family and you're, you're kind of putting them to waste because you keep stepping back into the ring and showing that wrestling is more important than them. MJF has a hell of a, an ability to take something that's in reality to twist it enough and to make it seem like that's the reason behind the feud. He is so fucking good at that. Yeah. I've seen people describe him now as like the Joker who's got a million origin stories. I read that. I believe, um, I don't remember who tweeted that, but I read that exact thing. Uh, I felt really bad once, you know, you're hearing, yeah, it's rude in reality. Cause that's what we've all been through. Breakups, they're hard, but luckily for him, he's, the world is literally his stage and he gets to go on TV and take a shitty thing in real life and make it art on tv so that was awesome that was a great segment uh he basically promised to give brian danielson early onset cte which is <laughs> phenomenal in some ways and really makes you want brian to beat him which is something i have to say i have seen a lot of people want brian danielson to win yeah and that's what like in the era of heels get cheered that's what you want. People want Brian Danielson to be champion so bad. Yeah. MJF is like the master of like saying something like this, which can make you somewhat feel sympathetic towards him because he is obviously he's suffered this seemingly suffered this breakup. And he talks about how this title is like the only thing that loves him and that he can trust because he just has throughout his life suffered so much that he can't trust anybody. But the way that he channels that towards his obsession with the title and his obsession with being the best and being the and like 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 that's that it's like it's something that you could find sympathy with but the way that he channels it makes him like the greatest heel and then the fact that he turns it on danielson and says like you you decide to waste the privilege that you have of a loving family of like your wife and your kids by stepping in the ring, despite the number of concussions that you had shows that you're just selfish and wasteful. And that's why I hate you rather than it's gone from just being the fact that like, he doesn't want to show that Danielson isn't the best wrestler in the world. It's more a case of, I hate you because you insist on wrestling despite the gifts that life already gives you. And the fact that you're willing to 
give all that up or risk that because you just can't get out of the ring. And then him just calling, like talking to Birdie and Buddy directly <laughs> down the camera and the brawl afterwards, which was just absolutely vicious. Like, I think this is one of those things that I think I think you'd appreciate that this has been a very well built feud already. Oh, yeah. but I think it's one of those ones that we'll look back on in a year or two and just say, look, wow, this we didn't we may not have appreciated this feud as much as we we should have. Or like it's one of those ones where you just like you look back at it and times like maybe you'd like when you if if you do ever look back on it and like try and break down the intricacies of it and how it built week to week to week, it's like yeah, this is really, really good storytelling. In the same way that people will look back on things with, like the Bloodline and the CM Punk and JF feud and all that stuff as well. Like, I th- I'd say this is up to that, up towards that level. I mean, it's already on my list of notes for best feud of the year. Oh yeah, it would absolutely have to be. I don't think it's good. I I, I would look forward to something uh, outmatching this. And the match itself, of course. We will talk more detail about when we get into our predictions next week, but 60 man or 60 minute, not 60 man, 60 minute Iron Man match, 60 man (laughs) Iron Man match with two people. (laughs) uh, That's going to be something that's going to eat up the bulk of the revolution card. But knowing AEW, they might be like, and there's 13 more matches anyway, and it's going to go on for nine hours, but we will give our full predictions for everything with the pay-per-view point double edition next week with the predictions coming up first of course and then the post show reviewing everything that happens after the pay-per-view and in the meantime those are our hot tags so i want to remind everybody to make sure that you support us and help us continue to keep doing these things by doing things like clicking that like button and all but also hitting up the patreon patreon.com slash smart out moment of course and if you go to the join button over there on YouTube, it is the exact same thing as the Patreon. You have the same tiers like that dark cast where we had talked about before. We did the spark madness tournament bracket stuff. You have the option for the picky poison. So we have a couple of weeks here where we're going to be trying to do some different main events over the course of, you know, the week after revolution, we're probably going to be doing something based off of talking about movies and um, pro wrestlers that have been in movies. And I actually, uh, last night I had watched the princess bride for the first time. So that is something that we were going to be talking about when we come to the Andre, the giant side of that. But there are so many different avenues. We could go down for that. We can watch some of these movies for like a fan ounce table slash fan tracks sort of thing. If you have any in mind that you want us to talk about, if you want us to dive deeper into some other topics or do something completely random, pick a poison. The whole point of it is you get to pick what it is. You're directly sponsoring that. So that is the best possible means for you to help support us going forward. But even if it's just a dollar a month, that also goes a long way, especially the more people that do it. You know, but think of it this way. If you lift with your pinky, then nobody has to lift with both their hands. And you can pick up some stuff on T Public and Redbubble when it comes to the merchandise side of things. All that money, of course. Well, not all that money. Most of it goes to T Public and Redbubble, but the small percentage of it that I actually get just comes back into funneling into smart out moment. And of course, fanboys anonymous. So keep all that in mind and make sure that you're also following all the other things you can see over on a mango tree.com or Anthony mango.com. You can see all my social media links for things like my Facebook and Twitter at Tony mango. You can see my letterbox. You can see the different things for smart out moment and for fanboys even my Instagram, which I never post anything on, but if you want to follow me there, go ahead. And uh, yeah, the Patreon stuff you can find there too. So share your support all around. If you support one, you support the other, anything that you water for a mango tree, all the roots go to the same uh, tree. So also follow what these guys are up to and stay tuned to what they've got on their platforms and stuff. Yep. You can follow me everywhere. Do police. You guys know the deal. I write for Fightful. I write for WrestleZone. You should check out both of those great websites. We will have so much content in the build to Revolution and beyond. And you can follow my link tree, which you can see my bio on all my social medias to just keep up with me. And I always appreciate the support. And I give you Callum Wiggins. So you can find me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. Uh, head on over to Smart Cat Moment for the power rankings, my weekly contribution, where this week we'll have the fallout from um, 
elimination chamber and all the stuff that happened there and how that affects the rankings as we move towards WrestleMania and we'll have the the final standings from uh from that to see who essentially wins the 2022-2023 season and also for the 2022-23 season we'll find out soon who wins the fantasy league so head on over to www.fantasyleague.com or find the fantasy league through the navigation on the smart camo website and you can see how our teams are doing as we head to the biggest show of the year all right everybody as i said next thing coming up is going to be the aew revolution pay-per-view point predictions coming up on we might end up doing that on thursday sometimes we've done that with the aew things because we wait until after that but kind of depends maybe it's wednesday then we incorporate any changes into the hot tags We'll see how our schedules go for next week, but we will be breaking down the predictions nevertheless. And then we will be talking about the po- uh, pay-per-view point post show afterward. So stay tuned, but that's it for this episode of the hot tags. Thanks for following and listening as always. And we will see you when we see you. This has been another smart guy moment and we are being counted out.